going to start off the list with a recent UFO sighting in Middletown. So in June of 2023, a number of residents reported seeing strange lights in the sky over town. The lights were in a circular formation, rotating. A man named Caden Little managed to capture the weird lights on video. We see them hovering in place, rotating in a counterclockwise direction before flying off at such an amazing speed that if you blink, it just looks like they've vanished completely. President of the Cincinnati Astronomical Society, Brian Simpson, looked at the footage, saying that the lights definitely weren't from a drone based on the speed at which they flew out of sight. I think this is a pretty cool piece of footage, but what do you guys think? Genuine hoax? Leave your thoughts down in the comments. And while you're at it, why not hit that subscribe button as well? Here's a creepy piece of footage from TikTok. A couple was hiking at night in Ohio when they pulled out their camera to film this pair of eyes peeking out at them from the tree line. At first, they thought it was a deer, but at one point they realized really doesn't seem to be a deer. Something about the way the eyes are moving and the fact that deers rarely decide to follow people. I really want nothing to do with human beings. So it becomes pretty clear that there's something else tailing them. Now we never get to see the creature in full. It lurks in the shadows the entire time. But some commenters have said it kind of moves like a big cat. Others have commented that it could be the Ohio Grassman or Dogman. Whether this was a cryptid or a predatory animal, Either would be terrifying. Eventually, the couple wisely decides to hurry out of there. The small village of Sabina once had something of a mascot, a very macabre mascot. It was a mummy. So in 1929, an African-American man in his mid to late 40s was found dead on a road near Sabina. No ID, just a dollar forty in cash and a scrap of paper with an address that turned out to be a vacant lot in Cincinnati. The authorities had no idea who this guy was, so they went with the name Eugene. Eugene the mummy was taken to Sabina's Littleton funeral home and embalmed. They put him in a brick shed by a bus stop, thinking maybe someone would recognize him during the 30-day viewing period, but no luck. Uh, folks in Sabina got kind of attached to their new resident though. They cleaned him up, they changed his clothes, uh, things got really weird though when local kids started playing with him and like moving him around, uh, even swiping his gold teeth. Teenagers would even take the poor guy out on joy rides. The mummy ended up being taken to Ohio State University and was placed on a bench outside the school to like scare students. The Littleton Funeral Home got wind of this and Eugene was sent back to Sabina and at this point it was clear the guy needed to be buried. Eugene got a plot in the local cemetery complete with a stone. That says he was found dead in 1929, buried 1964. His identity is still a complete mystery. Next up, we have the case of the Peninsula Python. I think this is one of my favorite stories to come out of Ohio. Uh, it's not often that a massive sized wild python ends up roaming through a middle American state, but in one magical summer in Ohio, that's exactly what happened. In the summer of 1944, Something strange happened in Summit County, Ohio, near the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. People started reporting sightings of a massive python about 15 feet long and incredibly thick. Now, at first, authorities didn't take these reports seriously, thinking it might be a hoax or some kind of wild exaggeration. As it turned out, though, what could have gone down is just another one of Ohio's many urban legends. It turned out to actually be very real. The residents were not making it up. Somehow a large python was let loose. No one could explain how the snake ended up in Ohio, but there it was. During that summer, the residents were terrified as the enormous snake roamed through farms, leaving behind indentations the size of giant tires. To make matters worse, the python even attacked livestock. I mean, of course it did, right? Authorities spent the whole summer hunting this thing down, but it was never found. It just disappeared eventually. Most likely it died from exposure during the harsh Ohio winter. Next up is the Crosswick Monster Case. This was a very well-documented case at the time and is one of the strangest stories ever to come out of the state of Ohio. Just saying a lot. So in 1882, two boys, Ed and Joe Lynch, had a really terrifying encounter with a strange creature in a field. They heard strange noises from tall grass and before they could react, they said they saw this large lizard-like beast with four legs 
come out of them. The creature approached the two, grabbed Ed in its jaws, and started dragging him towards a hauled out tree. Ed's screams ended up catching the attention of nearby men who rushed over to help. They managed to rescue Ed, but he was injured. After the incident, 60 men armed themselves with axes and clubs, and they formed a posse to hunt down this thing. They caught up with it, and the creature then stood on its hind legs. The chase led them to a hill of rocks where the creature escaped into a hole, never to be seen again. The local newspaper reported the story at the time, and it's since become a staple of Ohio's folklore. And I could see why. I mean, a lot of folks saw this thing that day. The exact nature of the creature, still a total mystery. So yeah, I, I don't know. I just love that story. Anytime there's like a multiple people who see something, that just uh, it, it makes it far more interesting for me. Next is another UFO case. This is the Trumbull County incident. This was a series of events where numerous residents reported seeing these unusual lights in the sky. Even police officers reported seeing things. Multiple residents reported sightings of odd lights in the night sky, describing them as bright and unusual aerial activities. Officer Toby Maloro was on duty that night. He was dispatched to investigate reported lights, and he was driving closer and closer to the source of these lights, keeping contact with the dispatcher, describing what he saw in real time. And at one point, radio communication was suddenly cut off, and his vehicle stopped. Maloro then became engulfed in a bright light from above. He got out of his vehicle for some reason to get a better view and reported seeing this massive circular object hovering in the sky. One of the strangest parts about his description of these events is that even though this thing was massive, it was almost completely silent. After a period of time, the object began to move away, and just as the craft moved off, his car and radio started working again. It's a pretty fascinating case, not just because of the detailed account made by Officer Malero, but all the corroborating reports from other residents as well. Now, a corroborated UFO case is one thing, but mass amounts of people frantically phoning into the police claiming to witness a large mutated octopus man? That is a whole other story. Very wild case right here. So the Octoman case. This unfolded on the 29th of January, 1959 in Cincinnati. It was a series of reports to the local cops about a bizarre octopus-like creature. The first report came from a man who urgently contacted police. He had a hard time describing what he was seeing because no one's ever seen a mutated octopus man before. And then a truck driver phoned up saying he'd encountered an unusual creature while driving into Cincinnati. Reports then just kept flooding in. The common thread with these calls is that people apparently sounded genuinely distressed. The creature was described as very large and had grayish skin a tentacle-like appendages, and a lopsided chest. Not sure exactly what that means, but I don't know, just maybe kind of like hunched, hunchback kind of. One witness provided a more detailed account stating it was large, not a dog or a cat. It leaped in front of my car on two legs and was taller than the auto. When I looked back in my mirror, it was moving along the bridge rail. It was three or four times the size of a man and much bulkier. I have an eye in mind for dimensions, and I know it was huge. If I ever had the opportunity to go back in time, like forget going to Woodstock or anything like that, I'd just be like, take me to Cincinnati, Ohio, January 29th, 1959. I just want to know what everyone saw that night. Like, was it just a guy with a horrible deformity? Was there just something weird in the air that night? Or was there a freaking octopus creature roaming around that bridge? I, I desperately want to know. The Cedar Bog Monster. So the Cedar Bog Monster is just one of Ohio's many variations of Bigfoot. Back in the 50s, people started spreading stories about a creature hanging out in the Cedar Bog Nature Preserve. It was described as a large, hairy figure standing around seven feet tall, with eyes that shined in the dark, and a not-so-pleasant odor. One of the most famous sightings was from a couple who had parked near the bog. They spotted the huge hairy creature strolling along Woodburn Road, which runs right beside the bog. They hightailed it out of there, of course, and reported the incident to the police. And there would be more and more accounts being reported. People started saying they were hearing strange noises in the woods, like grunts and howls. Some would find massive-sized footprints. Local news even featured the Cedar Bog Monster in a headline. 
Now, what I wonder is, if this thing really did exist, is it a different creature than the grass man and orange eyes and like all these other big hairy creatures roaming around Ohio? Or are these folks seeing the same creature or species of creature? These are the important questions you have to ask yourself. Another one of Ohio's strangest cases is the Werewolf of Defiance sighting. So in the summer of 1972, on the Norfolk and Western Railway in Defiance, two railroad workers, Ted Davis and Tom Jones, experienced a bizarre and unsettling event that would later be dubbed the Werewolf of Defiance case. It all began with Ted Davis, who while working away on the railroad, saw something otherworldly. He reported seeing a large wolf-like creature. The creature actually held a wooden board in its paws and without warning, it swung the board, striking Ted squarely on the shoulder. The creature then hastily retreated into the bushes like a coward. Five days later, Ted and his coworker, Tom Jones, returned to the railway for another day of work. For some reason, they didn't quit after that first encounter. Sure enough, the creature shows up again, and this time, it was actually a safe distance away from the two, uh, and Ted and Tom then reported their encounters to the local police. Little did they know that their report was just the beginning of a wave of Wolfman sightings in the area. Other reports started flooding in, each detailing sightings of this menacing wolf monster, but reports started to trickle out by the end of that summer. So, did people hear about that first report and just want attention? Was the whole thing a big hoax? Once again, I'd really love to go back in time and just, just hide by that railway to watch the whole thing play out. Finally, we have the case of the Minerva Monster. Back in 1978, folks in Minerva started talking about a hairy creature running around in the woods. A big, hairy, unknown beast. People claimed it was about seven feet tall, had reddish brown hair, and looked like a giant ape. Yes, another giant ape in Ohio. There are many. It all started when the Caton family saw this monster near a gravel pit outside their house. And they saw it on more than one occasion. One night they saw it peering at them through their window. It would also curl rocks at their home. A real awful creature. It scared the living daylights out of them, of course. They even said it smelled bad, like a mix of skunk and a wet dog. Not exactly a pleasant combo. Authorities were contacted and they came to investigate, but all that was left behind were large footprints around the family's property, leading back into the woods. A number of other residents also made reports about a similar creature around the same time, including the Kate's neighbor. It's still a complete mystery, though, as to what this thing was. Starting off our list today, we have the mystery of the color-changing Alaskan rivers. In recent years, scientists have found themselves bewildered by the changes in their waterways, including the 451 kilometers, 280 miles, of the monumental Kobuk River twists and turns through the northwest Alaska. Scrambling to figure out just what the heck is going on, and why not only have these waters started to turn orange, but why they have also experienced an extreme increase in acidity, the United States Geological Survey partnered with the National Park Service and the University of California Davis and the University of Alaska Anchorage and Public Pacific University together have set out to map the extent of the contamination as well as its impact on the ecosystem and the cause of it all. While the large group of scientists found their work to be inconclusive, they did come up with a few good theories. The first being that rising temperatures in the Arctic, which has been warming at an alarming rate of almost four times faster than the rest of the world, has caused permafrost to begin to thaw in certain areas of the state, releasing iron that had previously been held within the ice. Another theory suggests that not only was the color change due to excess levels of iron, but also the presence of bacteria, reducing the oxidized iron into the soil, which upon contact with the oxygenated water, turned a vibrant shade of orange and raised acidity levels to rival those of actual orange juice. Next up, we have Vampire Fish Rain. It's like that song Acid Rain, but instead of acid rain, it's vampire fish falling from the sky. Now, if you're starting to think I've lost my mind, let me explain. The sea lamprey, commonly referred to as the vampire fish, has been around since at least the 1800s, which is when it was first discovered. The jawless fish, which can grow up to 15 inches long, earned its nickname due to the fact that its mouth, which is ringed with many rows of sharp teeth, works as a suction cup, which 
which allows it to attach and suck the blood of its prey along with other bodily fluids. So now that we know what they are, let's just imagine what would happen if they started falling from the sky in our lawns, roadways, parking lots, beaches, and more. Well, the people of Fairbanks, Alaska don't have to imagine, as in 2015, it actually happened. Over the span of about a week, the Alaskan Department of Fish and Game received several calls from the residents of the town claiming to have found the fish popping up in the most unlikely places. Now, Some people have claimed this was due to seagulls scooping them up from the fresh waters and dropping them on land, but like there were a lot. And besides, vampire fish rain sounds way cooler anyways. Kushtaka is next on our list, also known as the Land Otter Man. The creature, which many locals claim to have seen, is said to be a mythical shape-shifting being that has commonly been referred to in the legends told by the Tinglet peoples of the Pacific Northwest Coast on North America. In some of the legends told, Kushtakas are described as monsters, cruel creatures who drag sailors to their deaths. However, other stories have depicted them as friendly and helping, with some even claiming that the creatures have often saved humans by freezing to death in the cold Alaskan climate. So it's a bit of a toss up on this one. Are they good or are they bad? And are they even real? I'll leave that up to you guys to figure out. Coming up next, we have the Slide Cemetery, located in the Klondike Gold Rush National Park. It was a dark day when scientists discovered the graves of an estimated 48 to 100 people, it's unknown as the records weren't so great back then, who perished in what is now described as the darkest day in the Klondike Gold Rush history. On April 3rd of 1898, many Alaska people took to the Chilkoot Trail in an effort to quickly reach the Klondike gold fields, but unfortunately, a large number of them never made it to the intended destination. It seems the deceased filled with dreams of collecting riches failed to heed the many warnings of weather concerns in the area, and as the aspiring gold collectors made their way up the steep trails, the wet spring weather and loose dirt and rock caused a 10 acre avalanche ending the lives of many and turning what was once a booming gold town into a desolate and melancholy area of mourning. The cemetery stands today as a reminder of this dark day in history. Up next, we have Lady of the Lake, the discovery of which left scientists and historians baffled and disturbed. So if you're picturing some ghostly woman standing at the edge of the water with decrepit skin and strangly hair, whose presence is depicted in horror stories and folklore, well, you'd be wrong. The Lady of the Lake is actually an abandoned WB-29 bomber aircraft, tail number 4462214. The aircraft, which flew in the 1940s during World War II, was used to detect evidence of nuclear testing from the Soviet Union while flying back and forth between Alaska and Japan. Makes sense, but what doesn't is how the aircraft ended up in the lake. Its first confirmed appearance in its final watery resting place was in 1964, but whether or not it crashed there, which it does not appear to have done so, or if it was placed there, there are absolutely no records, so it just really remains a mystery. Next we have the possible discovery of a supervolcano hiding just beneath the surface of the Alaskan islands. The question of the volcano's existence first arose on December 7th of 2022 when John Power, a geophysicist at the United States Geological Survey's Alaska Volcano Observatory presented a study that showcased a wide crater with arc-shaped ridges and around a 426-foot depth, 130-meter hollow entryway, presumably the tip of the supervolcano, and he presented it to his peers at the American Geophysical Union. While the discovery has yet to be confirmed, there is a mountain of evidence to support the existence of the mega underwater volcano. Geographical data as well as data collection from seismometers used to record micro-earthquakes around the islands point heavily to the confirmation of the volcano's presence. At this point in time, scientists are determined to confirm what exactly lies beneath the surface of these waters around the Alaskan islands as quickly as they can, because with the discovery of the possible volcano being so new, we have little to no information on whether or not this thing could blow at any time. And up next, we have another possible appearance and swift disappearance of underground pyramids hidden within the earth of the Alaskan Triangle. 
The discovery was made after a United States Senator Hale Boggs along with his pilot Nick Begich were flying over a part of Alaska commonly referred to as the Alaskan Triangle, known for its strange energy and high disappearance rate. As you might have guessed, both Senator and pilot disappeared, but that's not even the weirdest part. A survey of the area took place in an attempt to locate the missing persons, but instead found evidence of a pyramid shaped major underground structure. However, when they went back to confirm their discovery, it was as though the pyramid had completely disappeared. There are many theories about the commonly referred to dark pyramid, the most popular being that it is an alien pyramid, heavily guarded by the United States government, and some people even believing that the pyramid has special powers, such as the ability to generate enough electricity to power all of Canada. But what do you guys think it is? Let me know in the comments because I really love a good conspiracy theory. And starting off our top three, we have disappearances in the Alaskan Triangle, which of course was briefly mentioned in our last point, but let's dive a little bit deeper because since 1988, there has actually been a recorded total of 16 thousand disappearances in the area that lies between the lines of Anchorage, Jeannot, and, and Uktkwaivik. Of course, Boggs and Bigich being among the missing. No one can figure out why this specific area has caused so much confusion and turmoil. Of course, there are many theories, the presence of the Dark Pyramid being one of them, rough terrain being another, and possible magnetic disturbances as well. But the crazy part is that it's not just planes that disappear when entering this particular triangle-shaped portion of Alaska. Reports of alleged kidnappings, getting lost in the woods, sudden vanishings, and being buried by snow are by in no means of short supply. Scientists still can't seem to figure out what it is about this specific area that makes planes and people act so out of whack. Next, we have the petroglyph rocks found amongst the shores of Wrangell, an island town in part of Alaska's Inside Passage. For those wondering, a petroglyph is basically just a picture carved into a stone used to represent stories and knowledge. And if you'd like to see one, well, Alaska's got a bunch. While scientists argue over the purpose of the rocks, they have agreed that they were most likely created anywhere from 8 to 10,000 years ago, most likely by the native peoples that resided there at the time. But seeing as the depiction carved into some of the massive stones very closely mirror images of crop circles and other alien symbols, along with the fact that even after thousands of years the markings still remain so deep within the rock, the theory of the petroglyph's occurrence being a result of extraterrestrial artwork can't be ruled out. Not to mention, Alaska is also home to a giant underground pyramid, I'm just saying. And coming in at our number one spot, we have the golden egg. Okay, this one is super cool to me because it was found in the ocean and I'm always on the lookout for new aquatic discoveries, which by the way, if you've seen any recently, please let me know in the comments. But anyways, the flesh-like golden egg was recently discovered in August 30th of 2023 and this thing is weird. Found in the depths of the Alaskan seafloor, marine scientists are absolutely stumped as to what this thing could be. But many have speculated that it is most likely the egg casing of a a new unknown creature. On a live stream, one of the scientists noted that the egg had a hole in it, saying that meant something had either tried to get in or out. Another one of the marine spectators noted that when our collective knowledge can't identify it, it's something weird, adding what kind of animal could make an egg casing like that. The team of researchers was able to successfully collect the intriguing item from the seafloor and bring it to the surface, and have so far confirmed that the golden, flesh-like egg is in fact of biological origin, meaning it's not just some prop or piece of trash, but they have yet to truly identify the strange discovery. Let's start off with the mysterious disappearance of the Anasazi. The ancestral Puebloans, also known as the Anasazi, mysteriously disappeared from the Colorado Plateau around 1,300. AD, leaving a baffling historical puzzle behind. This advanced civilization, once thriving in intricate cliff dwellings and known for their remarkable pottery and architectural skills, vanished without a clear explanation. Their sudden disappearance, leaving behind hauntingly empty homes and undisturbed artifacts, has long puzzled scientists and archaeologists. Theories range from severe droughts disrupting their agriculture-based society to 
internal conflicts or even mass migrations to more hospitable lands. Yet, the absence of definitive evidence leaves us wondering, was their fate a result of natural causes, societal upheaval, or perhaps something more profound and unknown to our current understanding? Moving on to another mystery, this one sits beneath the tranquil waters of Rock Lake, Wisconsin. Here rests a hidden marvel of ancient architecture, a mysterious pyramid believed to be over 10,000 years old. This submerged structure poses baffling questions. How did such a sophisticated construction end up deep underwater? What civilization could have built this mysterious edifice, and for what purpose? Theories range from a lost civilization to unknown natural disasters, yet the dark, silt-laden waters of Rock Lake shroud these secrets in profound mystery, defying clear answers and fueling the imagination with possibilities of a forgotten chapter in human history. Taking it back to 1945, Flight 19, a squadron of five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers, mysteriously vanished over the Bermuda Triangle during a routine training flight. The flight's leader, Lieutenant Charles Taylor, was heard over the radio with a final, very ominous message. Quote, we are entering white water. Nothing seems right. This cryptic transmission was the last known contact with the flight. An extensive search operation was launched, but neither the planes nor the crew members were ever found, adding to the lore of the Bermuda Triangle. The disappearance of Flight 19 remains one of the most famous aviation mysteries. The experienced pilots, well trained and familiar with their route, inexplicably deviated from their course. Theory range from spatial disorientation to magnetic anomalies, but the truth remains a mystery. What could have led these skilled airmen into a fatal error, and how did they vanish without a trace in one of the most puzzling regions of the ocean? Moving on, we have the mass graves of Tulsa. In 1921, Tulsa, Oklahoma was the site of one of the most horrific racial massacres in American history, an event often overlooked in historical accounts. Known as the Tulsa Race Massacre, this tragedy resulted in the destruction of the Greenwood District, also known as the Black Wall Street, a prosperous black community. Recent excavations in the area have uncovered mass graves, a chilling testament to the scale of this atrocity. These findings serve as a grim reminder of the violence that was inflicted, with scientists and historians diligently working to identify the victims and reconstruct the events of those very dark days. Efforts are ongoing to bring closure to families and acknowledge a painful chapter in American history that has long been neglected. Moving on to Hexham, North America, where the discovery of two ancient stone heads in a garden led to a series of chilling events that baffled both locals and experts. These heads, believed to be of Celtic origin, were soon linked to unusual and terrifying occurrences, most notably sightings of a werewolf-like creature prior prowling the area. The phenomenon intensified, with reports of eerie noises and inexplicable disturbances in homes near where the heads were found. Strangely, even after the heads were removed from the site, the mysterious happenings persisted. This led to widespread speculation about a possible ancient curse or a supernatural connection, deepening the mystery and leaving more questions than answers in their wake. Moving on at our halfway point, we have the movie stones of Death Valley. At racetrack Playa in Death Valley, a peculiar and haunting spectacle unfolds. Here, heavy stones, some weighing hundreds of pounds, mysteriously glide across the desert floor, etching long trails behind them as if charting their secret journeys. For years, this baffling phenomenon has completely perplexed scientists. Initially, it seemed impossible for such heavy objects to move without human or or animal intervention. However, recent theories have brought a semblance of understanding, suggesting a combination of thin ice sheets forming under the rocks, and then strong wind gusts providing just enough force to set these stones in motion. Despite this, the exact mechanism behind this eerie dance of the desert stones remains elusive, continuing to intrigue and also completely mystify those who witness it. The silent, slow-moving journey of these stones across the barren playa represents a 
captivating natural puzzle, one that beautifully exemplifies the mysteries our planet still holds. In the small town of Falk, Arkansas, a legend lurks in the murky swamps. Residents have whispered and wondered about sightings of a large, ape-like creature known as the Falk Monster or the Southern Sasquatch. Since the 1950s, this creature has been the subject of numerous reports and of course local folklore. Described as a foul-smelling, nocturnal, bipedal being, it's said to roam the swampy, dense areas of the region, often shrouded in mystery and darkness. Eyewitness accounts vary, but common descriptions include glowing red eyes, a terrifying growl, and a towering height. Skeptics argue it might be a misidentified or undiscovered animal species, while others speculate about more supernatural origins. Is this creature a real undiscovered animal lurking in the southern wilderness, or a product of mass hysteria among the townsfolk? Or is there a more chilling explanation behind these sightings? You tell me. Moving on, we have the mystery of the Georgia Guidestones. In Elbert County, Georgia stands a monumental structure known as the Georgia Guidestones. Erected in 1980 by an anonymous group, this structure consists of six granite slabs towering over 19 feet high. The stones are inscribed with 10 guidelines in eight modern languages, advocating for concepts like population control, Control, environmentalism, and world peace. Additionally, there is a shorter message inscribed at the top of the structure in four ancient languages, Babylonian, Classical Greek, Sanskrit, and Egyptian hieroglyphs. The identity of those responsible for its construction and their intentions remains a complete mystery. This ambiguity has led to various interpretations and conspiracy theories. Are these stones a guide for post-apocalyptic survival, a manifesto? from a secretive group seeking a new world order, or perhaps a philosophical statement about humanity's future. Down in Florida, there is a remarkable structure known as the Coral Castle. Built single-handedly by the Latvian immigrant Edward Leedskalin from 1923 to 1951, this stone structure is composed of over 1,000 tons of oolitic limestone, with each megalithic stone weighing several tons. What makes this feat even more incredible is that Leedskalin stood just over five feet tall and weighed barely a hundred pounds. Yet he managed to construct the entire complex alone under the cover of night using only primitive tools. He claimed to have unlocked the secrets of the ancient Egyptian pyramids, harnessing a unique understanding of magnetism and earth energies to move these colossal stones. The intricacies of his method, like the turning of a nine-ton gate that moves with a touch, remains a mystery. How did one man accomplish such an architectural marvel, and what profound secrets of ancient construction techniques might he have rediscovered? And why the f did he not share that information with the rest of us? That's my question, okay? That's not in the script. That's just greedy. Greedy, greedy, greedy. <laughs> in southwestern Vermont, shrouded in the dense forest of the Green Mountains, lies a mysterious area known as the Bennington Triangle. This region gained notoriety for a series of chilling and unexplained disappearances that occurred between 1945 and 1950. Much like the infamous Bermuda Triangle, the Bennington Triangle seems to have a perplexing history of people vanishing without a trace, sparking a myriad of theories and folklore. Among the most notable disappearances was that of Paula Jean Weldon in 1946, a case that remains unsolved and continues to haunt the area. Theories range from natural causes and criminal acts to more otherworldly explanations like alien abductions or interdimensional portals. The dense wilderness and rugged terrain add to the mystery, making searches and investigations very challenging. What truly makes the Bennington Triangle so perilous, and what could be behind these mysterious mysterious disappearances. The answers remain as elusive as the victims themselves, buried deep in the silent, watchful woods of Vermont. In the vast, untamed wilderness of Texas, whispers of a fearsome creature known as the Wampus Cat have echoed through the ages. Countless locals hailing from remote towns and ranches claim to have encountered this enigmatic cryptid, leaving an indelible mark on the region's folklore. Descriptions of the Wampus Cat vary, but a common thread 
thread weaves throughout. Uh, it's a creature with the body of a monstrous feline, possessing sleek black fur that glistens under the moonlight. Its piercing glowing eyes pierce through the darkness, striking fear into the hearts of those who dare to gaze upon it. As diverse as the Lone Star State itself, some say the Wampus Cat prowls silently in the dense pine forests of East Texas, emitting blood-curdling cries that reverberate through the night. Others claim to have witnessed the creature sprinting across open plains, leaving behind a trail of shattered trees and a trampled earth. The bravest souls speak of unsettling encounters near secluded water sources where the Wampus Cat is said to drink, its presence sending wildlife scattering in terror. Those who have encountered the Wampus Cat speak of an uncanny primal energy emanating from the creature. Its presence is said to invoke an inexplicable sense of dread, as if crossing paths with an otherworldly force deeply rooted in the untamed heart of Texas. Whether the Wampus Cat is an embodiment of uh, ancient Native American legends or a creature yet to be fully understood, we still don't know. Number nine, the Chupacabra. The Chupacabra uh, is a legendary creature that has gained notoriety throughout the world. Sightings reported across Latin America, the United States. The creature is described as having a reptilian or canine-like appearance with large fangs and a pronounced spine along its back. It's said to prey on livestock, draining their blood and leaving behind a trail of carnage. One of the most famous encounters occurred in Texas, however, when a woman named Phyllis Canyon discovered what she believed to be the remains of the creature on the side of a road. Canyon was initially skeptical of reports of the chupacabra, but was pretty convinced of its existence after discovering this bizarre carcass. She had also had found several of her chickens dead on her property around the time she found this strange animal. Canyon's discovery sparked quite a media frenzy with reports and cryptid enthusiasts from around the world jumping in excitement. While some skeptics dismissed the creature as a coyote or other known animal, Canyon maintained that its appearance was unlike anything she had ever seen before. And it definitely could be some sort of wild dog with mange or something, but either way, pretty gnarly looking animal. In 2001, a 19-year-old driving in Pennsylvania reported seeing a bird-like creature with a wingspan of 10 to 15 feet and it had an elongated head. Two other witnesses later reported seeing similar creatures in the same area and all of this was very reminiscent of sightings in Texas in 1976 and 82 that were also described as looking sort of like an ancient pterosaur. These uh, sightings in Texas occurred near the location where the fossil of a large pterosaur was first discovered. And what was most fascinating about these sightings right? they seemed to have occurred close together in waves. So it, it seems like people were really seeing something. One possible explanation could be the frigate bird, which can have a wingspan of up to eight feet. Frigate birds tend to soar for long periods and only land to tend to their young. At number seven, we have Sasquatch, because these things are everywhere, apparently. Everyone has their own version of this big, hairy beast. So look, Sasquatch needs no introduction, but I'm gonna give the big, hairy lug one anyway. The Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, as he's commonly known, is basically the ultimate celebrity cryptid. Everyone knows who he is, but nobody has actually seen him in person, or have they? Apparently, Texas is home to many Bigfoot sightings. It seems that he's been spotted more than a few times wandering around in the woods. Some people claim that he's up to 10 feet tall, because everything is bigger in Texas, covered in hair, and uh, smells like a wet dog. Others say that he's more of a, uh, a gentle giant who just wants to be left alone. All I know is there really are Bigfoot roaming around in the wilderness of Texas. They gotta be just sweltering hot with all that fur. The legend of the donkey lady of San San Antonio of San Antonio is a famous Texas urban legend. According to the legend, the donkey lady is a half human, half donkey creature that roams the area. Some say she was once a beautiful woman who was tragically burned and disfigured in a fire. Some say she was thrown in a river with her pet donkey and now haunts the Elm Creek Bridge. Some claim to have actually seen her and it's a tale that's been passed down from generation to generation and who knows, maybe there's some truth to it. I mean, if, if you squint your eyes while looking at a donkey long enough, it, it sort of looks like a person, right? And if you've ever heard a donkey braying in the middle of the night, not hard to imagine it could 
could be some sort of supernatural creature. Then again, maybe the donkey lady is just a misunderstood animal, human hybrid who's just trying to find her place in the world. Up next, we have the skunk ape. Oh boy. Do I love the skunk ape? The skunk ape is a legendary cryptid that is mostly seen in Florida, but there have also been numerous sightings in Texas and a couple other states. This creature is similar to Bigfoot, but it is said to have a distinct odor. That's the name. And it also likes hanging around swamps. That's where most apes tend to hang out in nature. Many people have claimed to have seen this elusive creature, and some even have photographic evidence to support their claims. In 2000, a series of photos surfaced taken by a woman on her back porch that showed what appeared to be a skunk ape walking through a swampy area. And I have always loved these photos. Yes, it could definitely be an escaped orangutan or, or something, but uh, it's pretty freaky nonetheless. And if it is a costume, which I really don't think it is, uh, it's a it's got to be a pretty damn good one. The photos were taken in Florida, but it's not surprising that there have been sightings in Texas as well. After all, Texas is a, a vast state with plenty of forests and wilderness areas where a creature like the skunk ape could hide. Despite the many sightings and alleged evidence, there are still skeptics who don't believe in the existence of Skunk Ape. But for those who have seen it or have smelt its distinctive odor, there's no denying there is something strange and mysterious lurking in the swamps and woods of Florida and Texas. The Black Eyed Children. Black Eyed Children are a mysterious and creepy phenomenon that have captivated the attention of paranormal enthusiasts for years. The supposed sightings involve encountering children with completely black eyes, just no sclera in there. And they seem to appear out of nowhere and ask to be let into people's homes or vehicles. Sometimes they ask you to help them with a, a small favor, but their true intentions are sinister because they have pure black eyes. Some people believe these children are demonic or extraterrestrial in origin, while others believe they are simply a, a creepy urban legend. The first written account of the black eyed children, or at least the, the most famous, came from Texas reporter Brian Bethel in 1996. Bethel shared his experience of encountering two children with completely black eyes while sitting in his car. Since Bethel's account, numerous reports of black eyed children have emerged, with many claimed have reported feeling a sense of dread and unease when encountering this, these mysterious rascals. And I think I know why people feel a little off seeing these kids. Uh, their eyes are pure black. That would, that would do it for me. The Beast of Bears. The Beast of Bears is a cryptid that is said to roam the wilds of Texas, resembling a large, scarred up bear with missing patches of fur. It's rumored to live near swamps, adding to the creature's uh, mysterious allure. Some even say that it has gills, making it a uh, true Really unique and peculiar creature. What kind of bizarre mashup of things is this? Uh, Goatman uh, uh, apparently has gills too. So why are all these big hairy Texas monsters also aquatic? Anyway, the Beast of Bears also boasts large red eyes like those of the Mothman, which only adds to the intrigue surrounding this cryptid. The first sighting of the Beast of Bears was in 1973 at a camping spot near the town of Alice, Texas. Since then, over 31 sightings have been reported with the most recent being in a backyard outside Crestview, Florida. However, the Beast of Bears is most closely associated with Texas. Many reports of sightings coming from various parts of the state. Despite skeptics dismissing the Beast of Bears as a hoax, there is evidence to suggest that the creature may be real. Even a drawing of the creature suggests that it may be found not only in Texas, but also up in Canada. Some have even linked the Beast of Bears to Inuit stories about giant bears that drag people underwater water and eat them. And coming in at number two, the Lake Worth Monster. The Lake Worth Monster, also known as the famous Goatman, is a cryptid that has long captivated the attention of Texans. Sightings of the creature began in the summer of 1969, when a group of people reported encountering a strange half-man, half-goat-like creature near Lake Worth, just outside of Fort Worth. Descriptions of the creature vary, but most witnesses report seeing a towering, hairy beast with a goat's head, cloven hooves and the ability to leap great distances. Some descriptions of the strange beast, and some even describe it as having fishy scales, uh, a 
all over its body, which don't seem to fit. But anyway, over the course of several weeks, the creature was allegedly cited by numerous individuals, leading to a media frenzy and an increased public interest in the elusive creature. One article written by reporter Jim Mars was written with the, uh, I gotta say, hilarious headline, Fishy Man Goat Terrifies Couple Parked at Lake Worth. Love that. Some locals claimed the creature was aggressive, throwing car tires and rocks at those who stumbled upon it, while others reported it simply observing them from a distance. And finally, we have the NASA gargoyle. There have been multiple sightings of this mysterious creature, but the first reported sighting, and definitely the most famous, was from NASA employee Frank Shaw, who worked in Houston's Johnson Space Center. Shaw had reported walking back to his car after his shift and spotted what looked to be a large, winged, jet black humanoid creature perched on one of the Space Center's buildings. Suddenly, it started unfurling its wings, which apparently made this awful crackling sound, and then it just swooped into the air. I'm, I'm picturing the creature from Jeepers Creepers here, so not pleasant. Shy had been uh, completely stunned, frozen in fear at the sight of whatever this beast was, but suddenly he kind of snapped out of it as soon as the thing flew into the air and started making his way back to his car, where in classic horror movie fashion, he struggled to get his keys into the door. I'm picturing him just kind of like dropping them a couple times. <laughs> but he finally uh, got into his car and just flew out of there. Here's what's really interesting about this incident though. Apparently there were other employees at the station who had also had encounters with the winged monstrosity. Apparently there had been a file opened on the creature just a few months before Shaw saw it, after two German shepherds at the station had been found completely mutilated in the same area as Shaw's sighting, so. That's pretty interesting. And we're starting off this list with what has been dubbed the Lover's Lane case. In 1990, a young couple, Cheryl Henry, 22, and Andy Atkinson, 21, headed out to spend the night together, but they were never seen alive again. Their bodies were found the next day in a wooded area in West Houston known as Lover's Lane. The scene was pretty horrific. There were slash wounds to both of their necks, Andy was found tied to a tree and Cheryl was found underneath a collapsed fence. Authorities were able to take DNA samples of whoever the assailant was, but they were never able to match it to anyone, meaning most likely this guy had no criminal record. And I do say guy because of the type of DNA they obtained. Over 30 years later, this case has sadly never been solved and whoever's responsible could still be roaming around out there. The Amber Hagerman case. Amber Hagerman, a nine-year-old girl from Arlington, Texas, was at her grandparents' house on January 13th, 1996. Her and her younger brother were out playing. Amber was on her bicycle and she started riding further and further down the road towards a grocery store. Her brother decided to turn back, but Amber never came back. She had been taken by a man in a black van in the grocery store parking lot. There was only one witness to her abduction. An intense search effort began with the community rallying together and law enforcement agencies mobilizing to try and find her. Sadly though, four days after her abduction, Amber's body was discovered in a local creek, not a long way from where she was abducted. What makes this case extra tragic is the fact that the assailant has never been found. This this tragedy led Amber's mother, Donna Norris, to help establish the Amber Alert System, though an emergency notification system designed to rapidly disseminate information about abductions to law enforcement agencies, media outlets, and the general public. That's that little ringer thing you get on your phone, the little updates. The Amber Alert System uh, has since been adopted and implemented in numerous countries around the world, so if there's anything anything good that came out of the case, it's that. Next up we have the Killing Fields. This is a stretch of land located in League City near Interstate 45, where numerous bodies have been discovered over the years, leading to one of the most haunting and perplexing mysteries in the state's history. Since the 1970s, law enforcement authorities have uncovered the remains of multiple victims in this desolate area, earning it the chilling nickname. The identity of the assailant or assailants responsible for these deaths remain unknown and whose victims were primarily young women. Despite extensive investigations, the authorities have struggled 
to piece together the puzzle and bring the perpetrators to justice. Various theories and speculations have of course emerged over the years, ranging from the involvement of multiple assailants to potential connections with other unsolved crimes in the region, the families of the victims, as well as dedicated investigators persistently seek answers, hoping to one day unveil the truth and find a bit of closure. The Phantom of Texarkana The Phantom of Texarkana. Back in the spring of 1946, a series of violent attacks happened in a 10-week time span. Whoever this creep was, they wreaked havoc in the town of Texarkana, going on a rampage of terror. He operated at nighttime, targeting mostly young couples who were just minding their own business, parked in the dark corners of the town. There have been eight victims, and five of which lost their lives. Law enforcement went into overdrive trying to catch this elusive boogeyman, but he managed to slip through their fingers every single time. The whole town was on edge. Folks were locking their doors, looking over their shoulders. The media ate it up, uh, too, referring to it as the Texarkana Moonlight Murders. And the story spread far and wide, making this a pretty infamous case. The phantom vanished as quickly as he appeared, though, leaving the town and its residents in a state of shock, confusion. Decades have passed and his true identity still remains a mystery. The Icebox. In June of 1965, the residents of Houston, Texas were left in shock and confusion when the lifeless bodies of Fred and Edwina Rogers were discovered inside their own home. But what made this case truly macabre was the manner in which their bodies were found. They had been stuffed inside the family's refrigerator. The horrifying nature of the crime, coupled with the absence of any clear motive or suspects, has propelled the case into this realm of mystery. Investigations into the Icebox case were met with numerous baffling elements. The lack of forced entry suggested that the assailant was either known to the victims or possessed an intricate knowledge of their routine. The home had also been meticulously cleaned after the attack, which made, you know, gathering up evidence pretty difficult. And there was also this absence of a clear motive, which really added another layer of intrigue to it, leaving the investigators grasping at straws for answers. Over the years, theories surrounding the Icebox case have circulated. Some speculate that the crime was a result of a family dispute, while others entertain the possibility that someone could have been hired to commit the act. And then, of course, there are those who hypothesize that the assailant may have simply been a deranged individual who really had no motive and attacked them completely at random. At number five on the list, we have the televangelist bomber. This disturbing case began back in January of 1990 when a mysterious package was sent to Lakewood Church in Houston. The daughter of Pastor John Austin opened the package and it exploded. Luckily, she survived, but received third degree burns and cuts to her legs and abdomen. In April of that same year, a second package was sent. This one to the Christian Broadcasting Network in Virginia, where a security guard named Scott Sheepers almost lost his life. The package had looked suspicious and the TV station had received death threats before, so they were pr on pretty high high alert in general. They put the package through an x-ray machine. Sheepers didn't spot anything out of the ordinary at first, but something about it still seemed off to him. He went to cut into part of the box before taking a couple steps back, which point the package exploded and sending Sheepers flying to the floor. He was transported to the hospital where shrapnel was removed from his leg and he did survive. Both packages had been sent from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Until this day, the identity of the sender has never been found. Number four, Sam Bass's treasure. All right, Sam Bass was this notorious outlaw during the late 1800s. He was known for his daring train robberies. According to the lore, Bass and his gang managed to accumulate quite a substantial fortune through their criminal activities, amassing a hidden treasure that till this day has never been fully recovered. The whereabouts of Bass's treasure has remained a mystery, fueling countless 
treasure hunting expeditions and inspiring countless stories and speculations, many believe that Bass buried his loot in various locations across Texas, particularly in the areas around Denton where he operated. Some claim that Bass left cryptic clues and treasure maps, teasing treasure hunters with the possibility of finding his hidden riches. Over the years, numerous treasure seekers have dedicated themselves to try and unravel the secrets of the whereabouts of his treasure. They have combed through historical records, studied old maps, and explored the Texas landscape in search of his stash. Despite their efforts though, the treasure has never been found. It's kind of like a Western version of One Piece. I love it. The thing is though, I think if someone did find it, I mean, would they report it? Or would they just kind of like keep it to themselves? I don't know. Maybe someone has found it. At number three, we have the case of Lori Ruff. Lori Ruff was this woman with a seemingly ordinary existence, although she was always rather secretive about her past. And her husband, Blake Ruff, had a lot of questions. And as it would turn out, she wasn't exactly who she seemed. In 2010, she ended up taking her secrets to the grave after taking her own life, leaving behind a trail of these perplexing clues and unanswered questions. Blake Ruff discovered a lockbox in her closet that only added to his confusion surrounding her past. It seemed as if Lori previously went by the name Becky Sue Turner. But Becky Sue Turner was the name of a girl who had died in a house fire back in 1971. So Ruff was left in kind of utter shock, confusion. Who was this woman he'd married back in 2003? Investigators were on the case, and as it turned out, Becky wasn't her only other name. Lori was actually born as Kimberly McLean, who had gone missing in 1986. She had run away from home at 18 years old. The question still remains though, why did she leave home? And how did she acquire the birth certificate of a girl who died in 1971. At number two, we have the Marfa Lights. The mystery surrounding the Texas Marfa Lights has fascinated locals and visitors alike for decades. Nestled in the remote desert landscape near the town of Marfa, these unexplained phenomena manifest as strange floating orbs of light that appear in the night sky. Witnesses have described them as glowing orbs of various colors ranging from white, yellow, to blue and red. Lights often dance and dart and hover in the distance, defying all conventional explanations. Numerous theories have been proposed, of course, to explain the origin of these lights, but none of them have actually been able to fully unravel it. Some speculate that they are the result of natural occurrences like atmospheric gases or reflections from distant headlights. Others attribute them, of course, to supernatural or extraterrestrial origin, believing that they are the work of ghosts or alien visitations. Skeptics argue that the lights are simply the, you know, product of illusions or, you know, misinterpretations. But uh, there's quite the allure behind it, and it's led to the establishment of viewing areas and research centers dedicated to studying and observing them. Scientists, paranormal enthusiasts, and curious visitors flock to the region in search of answers. So that's something I'd like to see. I might have to take a trip to Texas, find some treasure, see some cool lights. It'll be a good time. And finally, we have the Leveland UFO case. This case stands as one of the most compelling incidents in the history of unidentified flying objects and unfolded on the night of November 2nd, 1957 in Leveland, Texas, when the multiple witnesses reported encountering a series of bizarre events involving unidentified flying aircraft or aircrafts. Throughout the night, several motorists reported their vehicles stalling and electrical systems failing as they observed a large, almost egg-shaped object hovering in the vicinity. The witnesses described the craft emanating a blinding light in this intense heat. The accounts of the Leveland UFO sightings were remarkably consistent too, with witnesses from different locations reporting similar experiences. Law enforcement officers and local authorities were flooded with these reports throughout the night, which really adds to the credibility of the events. However, when law enforcement officers did arrive on these scenes, the crafts had already disappeared. This case uh, attracted the attention of the United States Air Force, leading to an investigation by Project Blue Book, the official U.S. government program tasked with studying UFO reports. Despite their efforts, though, no definitive explanation was ever provided. Skeptics have offered theories ranging from, again, atmospheric phenomena to maybe electrical disturbances, but but others believe this is genuine extraterrestrial encounter. But others still believe it's uh, it's aliens, which I, I also like that idea a lot more. There's a 
just this consistency and the number of witnesses, which uh, again, very interesting. Number 10. Mothman. So the Mothman is this uh, big old flying dude with wings and red eyes. Floats around and you know what? Boo! Mothman sucks. Look, okay, I grew up in the area where this cryptid supposedly like haunted and you know what? Yeah, I did see him. You know, big old spooky red eyes flying around doing whatever. Oh no, he was near a bridge when it collapsed. He precipitated a disaster. Ugh. The only thing that actually happened to me when I saw him was just my house flooded. I failed all my final tests and my girlfriend broke up with me. I mean, who even cares, right? God, Mothman is such a loser. Oh, I'm a big scary moth. Look at me. Oh, I'm mothing it up. Oh. No, I'm not better. Shut up. Number nine, Demon Cat. Good old Demon Cat. Making its home in Washington, D.C., this fiendish feline is known to stalk the White House and the United States Capitol building. Supposedly in the 1800s, cats were brought to the Capitol building as a means of combating the rat problem. And while they couldn't get all the politicians, some legends claim that one cat remained stalking the basements. It can only be seen prior to elections and other tragedies in Washington, supposedly having been seen before the assassinations of JFK. FK and Lincoln. Why has this kitty stuck itself in the minds of those who have seen it? Well, apparently when spotted, this cat actually grows to massive proportions, leaping at its viewer before just vanishing. Now, some blame the Capitol Police Force's poor screening for alcoholics at the source of this misunderstanding, as when viewed from the floor, anything might appear large. But as one guard was apparently taken by a heart attack upon seeing the categorical size of such the beast, who can really say for sure. Number eight, sewer alligators. Taking a big old bite out of the big old apple are our guys in green, the sewer gators. According to the New York Times, there's actually a massive problem with folks trying to keep alligators as pets within the city. But as for the ones that aren't caught, what might happen to their pets once they've outgrown their owners? Now legend has it that in the 1930s, an infestation began, gators making their home within New York's stinky subsystems. Supposedly, they've clashed with the NYPD, who claimed to have vanished their bescaled opponents, though sightings have continued throughout the modern days. Likely their greatest impact was the inspiration for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, though I might just be making that up. Number seven, the Honey Island Swamp Monster. Better known as Le Bête Noir, this humanoid horror is reported to be located within the Honey Island Swamp in Louisiana. Described as walking on two legs and seven feet tall, Le Bête Noir is reported to be preceded by a foul odor. Now, casts have been taken of its feet, showing a total of four toes, which indicates that it may not be related to humans or apes. As some legends claim that a crashed circus train may have allowed for a band of chimpanzees to escape into the wild, where they probably adapted to their environment and fell into legend. Knowing how circuses generally treat their animals, eh, good for them. Number six, lava bear. Discovered in the area surrounding South Central Oregon, the lava bears are a group of extremely small bears that have been observed emerging from the lava beds common to the area. Several hunters have claimed to have caught these ferocious beasts, which initially appeared to be bear cubs, but were in fact fully grown adults. Once news of this made rounds, the hunt for the bears was on, and in 1923, one was caught by a US Forest Service trapper by the name of Alfred Andrews. Andrews was offered a reward for the bear's body, but turned it down in favor of parading it around the country, making quite a chunk of change on the side, until his partner stole the bear and vanished. Uh, several other bears have been captured, and in 1924, one of the local high schools decided that its mascot would become the lava bear. It is also still their mascot, seriously. Number five, the black dog. Yeah, I put this in here to contrast the demon cat because I, you know, think they should be friends. The black dog is a demonic creature originating in Europe, most famously in the story The Hound of the Baskervilles, but it's also been cited in the States. A beast with burning red eyes, W.H.C. Pynchon wrote, if you meet the black dog once, it shall be for joy. If twice, it shall be for sorrow, and the third time shall bring death. Demonic dogs have been spotted in Connecticut and Massachusetts, and truckers have a saying where if you see one, it's time to pull over or a crash will be the least of your concerns. Number four, Ludwig the Bloodsucker. Back to New York, and it turns out that gators aren't the only things looking to take a bite out of streetwalkers. Described as a three foot tall German man, Ludwig the Bloodsucker is reported to be a local vampire. Now legends claim that he was too minute to take down a German 
German man and too ugly to seduce a German woman, so he just booked it over to the states for easier pickings. Haunting the Bowery Street, several victims were left alive but incessantly mocked by the vampire, usually for their drunken stupor. Local newspapers reported about the man's habits, locating him as a German tailor by day. There are apparently even interviews where he goes on record to claim that blood is healthy and good eating. Mixed with the way that immigrants were treated at the time, I doubt that went over well. Number 3. Two Toed Tom Listen, there's a lot of gators in the states, but Two Toed Tom might be the most famous. The story goes that this 14 foot alligator could be identified for having lost all but two toes to a trap, and would eat farmers and their livestock. Now, Fed up with the beast, many brave men would band together to hunt the reptile, but whether it was ex-military marksmen or dynamite brandishing pharmacers, none could destroy this devil. Bored with Alabama, the gator was reported to have left its hunting grounds, apparently settling for Florida, where there would be more failed attempts to take down two toes. Fifty years later, a series of two-toed tracks were discovered near his old hunting ground, and the legend of two-toed Tom marches on. Number 2. Hodag Now this strange creature made its home in Wisconsin, described as possessing the head of a frog, the face of an elephant, short legs with massive claws, the back of a dinosaur, and a long spiked tail. Reported by land surveyor and trusted member of the community Eugene Shepard, he rounded up a group of brave hunters to capture the beast, an attempt which apparently required the usage of dynamite. Sending a picture of its remains to the media, they declared the safety of its primary food source for all time to come, the White Bulldog. Thank goodness that the White Bulldog may now roam Wisconsin once more. Alright, fine, it was a big hoax, and it was a really good one. Good enough that the local town decided to build a statue in honor of the beast. They also hold a festival in its name, which I've actually been to. But the effort that went into this hoax was actually quite extensive, and when Shepard had claimed to capture the creature, he even displayed it using a puppet show, piloting a wooden facsimile of the beast. Number 1. The Jersey Devil Ah, here's a real classic, the Jersey Devil. Known for living in… Uh, Jersey. Well, ok, taste and location aside, this creature is a sight to behold, a horse-like demon with bat wings and f a forked tail. It was apparently born human, the 13th offspring of Mother Jane Lee needs, who had cursed the unborn upon discovery of her pregnancy. Once born, the demon was revealed in all its horror, and gave everyone in the room a highly motivated beatdown before yeeting itself up and out the chimney. There have been sightings of this creature throughout history, one of the most notable viewers being Napoleon's brother. Seriously. This creature has also been reported to be capable of surviving direct cannon fire, and in 1909 there were a slew of sightings which set off a search for the fabled devil. A search which mostly ended in vain, even though there was a $10,000 reward that was promised for live capture. And of course, someone then tried to submit a kangaroo with fake claws and bat wings. Hmm. Anyways, it's just another reason not to go to Jersey, and it's just about as good of one as any. Starting us off at number 10, Lafitte Guest House. Once the mansion of a very rich man named Paul Gleese and his family, by the 20th century the building became a hotel and has been visited by countless guests throughout the years. But despite the many families that have lived in the mansion prior, it is not them who haunts the building, but a girl named Marie who died of yellow fever while staying in room 21 with her mother. Legend has it that her mother was so distraught by Marie's death that she would often revisit the hotel and stay in the very room where Marie lost her life. And years later, she too died in room 21. The two ghosts haunt the grounds, terrifying visitors who stay in their room, perhaps hoping to convince them never to return. Those that have stayed report seeing Marie in the mirror in the middle of the night, and that during the day, she can be seen walking walking around the grounds, striking up a conversation with you before vanishing into thin air. And if that doesn't freak you out, the mother's gut wrenching sobs can also be heard at night, and she too has been known to frighten the guests by turning the lights on and off or throwing objects around to get your attention. All those that enter the room claim to immediately feel a sense of despair and sorrow come over them, and none that visit wish to return. Coming in at number 9, The Logan Mansion. 
Kitchen. Built in 1897 for a beer distributor named Lafayette R. Logan, this mansion is believed to be haunted by the ghost of a girl named Theodora Hunt, allegedly the neighbor of Mr. Logan, who one day leapt out of a third floor window in the attic and plummeted to her death. For years, it has been regarded as one of the most haunted places in the state, with many recent visitors claiming to see items moving on their own, doors mysteriously locking and unlocking themselves, and the giggles of Theodora Hunt coming from the attic. While Theodora tends to be more mischievous than anything, there have been other visitors claiming to hear haunting voices and apparitions in the window where Theodora allegedly fell to her death, and some fear that she has company, and that is what most are truly afraid of. Next up at number 8, the Shreveport Municipal Auditorium. Built between 1926 to 1929, it originally served to commemorate the soldiers who served and lost their lives to World War I. Nowadays, it's a historical performance and meeting venue and widely known to be riddled with ghosts and paranormal activity. Audience members, tour guides, and staff alike have all experienced something strange while spending time in the building, like doors opening and shutting all on their own, disembodied voices echoing throughout the halls, as well as strange, inexplicable sounds lurking in the shadows. Although not all the spirits are terrifying, one reportedly is often heard clapping and saying, I love Johnny Cash. There are far more creepy ghosts than friendly ones. Reportedly, a girl is often seen running around the auditorium and no one knows just who she is or why she's there. And according to legends, during the Louisiana Hayride, a woman died in labor in the basement bathroom. And some claim to have heard her moans as if she's still trying to deliver. Coming in at number 7, The Miller Cemetery. Located in Eunice, Louisiana, the Miller Cemetery has more than just buried bodies to creep out visitors. One ghost in particular is known to haunt the grounds, and it's because of him that locals nicknamed it the Headless Cemetery. The Headless Ghost is known to frequent the area, roaming around the graves at night and terrifying guests. But what's strange about this ghost is he's not headless for any horrific death, but allegedly because nobody remembers his face due to the unrecognizable picture on his tombstone, or at least least that's the legend we've been told. If a headless ghost isn't enough to keep you away, many have also reported their cars suddenly not working or breaking down as soon as they are on the gravel road by the cemetery. So if you do dare enter, you might just be stranded, and who knows what the headless ghost will do to you then. Next up at number 6, Forbing Tracks. Strangely, or maybe not so strangely, I don't really know the statistics on this one, Miller Cemetery is not the only place in Louisiana where a headless ghost is known to roam. The Forbing railroad tracks as well have terrifying ghosts that many claim to haunt the grounds at night. Legend has it, one night an old man was reportedly beheaded and his ghost now wanders the tracks holding a lantern and scaring all that see him. But that isn't all. Apparently a bunch of students also died here many, many years ago after allegedly being hit by an oncoming train. Legend has it that if you park your car on the tracks and put flower on the back of it, it will mysteriously begin to move on its own, showing the handprints of the students in the flower on the back. But if I were you, I would not try it out for yourself, otherwise you too might be a ghost haunting the tracks of Forbing, Louisiana. Next up at number 5, Magnolia Plantation. I am sure it comes as no surprise that a plantation would be the breeding grounds for tortured spirits, considering how much horrifying and cruel activity occurred on their property during the early to mid 19th century. And Magnolia's plantation is among some of the most haunted. There are stories that a large portion of the activity at this plantation has to do with the countless voodoo curses that were placed on the original owners, but others say that the real horrors of the property are due to the dying room. The name was given to the haunted room as there have been countless tales of slaves and other residents taking their lives in it when they could no longer endure the agony of their existence. Visitors have reported hearing their screams from the dying room to this day, as well as seeing the many spirits 
spirits lurk around the property. As well, a union major is believed to have been poisoned in the same room, and sometimes at night, you can see his distorted face in the window of the very room he died in. Others claim to have heard chanting, slamming doors, flickering lights, and investigators have even captured audio recordings from several spirits. And maybe most crazy is that motion sensors have been known to go off and on when no one was around. Listen, everyone that visits agrees they are not wanted there. Coming in at number 4, to Frere's house. Although now it's a cozy bed and breakfast, to Frere's has a dark history from its time as a plantation. And as such, it comes with a bevy of ghost sightings that will chill you to the bone. The most well known legend of the property is that a woman named Amelie Camo once jumped into a well after losing her family to yellow fever. Her body was later buried on the property and some believe she still haunts the grounds weeping for the family she lost. Others have reported a little girl living in the attic that may come and speak to you, usually asking you to viens voir, which means come see in French. And I'm afraid to know just what she may want you to come up and see. Originally there was a piano in the house that guests could play, but it had to be removed after countless complaints of it being played in the middle of the night and waking up guests. But of course, when the owner would go to check, no one would ever be playing it. So if you're feeling brave, you can go ahead and stay, but as for me, I think I will look for somewhere where a creepy girl ghost doesn't try to swoon me into following her up into an attic. Coming in at number 3, Central Louisiana State Hospital. Believed to be haunted by the near 3,000 patients that are buried on the grounds, this psychiatric facility from 1904 is actually still operating today, believe it or not. Reportedly haunted by all those that died on its grounds, many hospital staff claim to experience extremely strange and creepy activity nearly every single day. Many say they constantly hear slamming doors from one secured only moments prior, witnessing chairs being flipped over when no one was in the room, and even glasses shattering after being hucked across the room. On one occasion, a piece of flooring was discovered broken into pieces, almost as if exploded. Nothing had been broken moments earlier, and none of the staff could figure out how it broke, or rather, what had broken it. As it's still a fully functioning hospital, it's not open to visitors, but some some will walk past the building and swear they can hear strange voices or bright shining lights coming from inside the building. Coming in at number 2, Dauphine Orleans Hotel. The historic Dauphine Orleans Hotel opened somewhere around the 1770s and has remained one of the most well known buildings in the French Quarter, but not for its hospitality, instead for its terrifying ghost sightings. Back in its heyday, there was a brothel in the French Quarter owned by a woman named May Bailey. And what was especially unique about Bailey's business was that she actually had a permit for it, making it completely legal. But despite its legality and popularity among many, May Bailey's sister, Millie, resented her for forcing her into the line of work. Hoping for a way out, Millie ended up meeting a confederate soldier and the two got engaged. But sadly on the morning of the wedding, her betrothed was shot dead. And so Millie remained trapped to her life of courtship. Today visitors and staff have reported seeing her roam the halls in her wedding dress, sobbing and crying out for her lost love. But that is not the worst that's been witnessed. Employees say they routinely see glasses fall off shelves, doors unlatched after just being locked, and there is even one account of a bar stool levitating off the ground. But most terrifying of all are the legends of guests checking in and never leaving the hotel. So if I were you, I would pick somewhere else to stay for the night. And last up in our number one spot. Hotel Provincial. Branded as one of the most haunted places in New Orleans, the Hotel Provincial is located in the infamously haunted French Quarter. And just like every building around it, of course, it's horrifyingly haunted. Now, back in the day, there was a military hospital just down the street from the hotel. And one of the buildings used a medicinal herb garden for the hospital. Which seems a little strange, but does make sense once you find out the kind of spirits that haunt the hall. 
walls. Today the hotel consists of 5 buildings and although ghosts are known to lurk in each, the most haunted building is believed to be number 5. Guests of building number 5 have reported seeing insane things such as confederate soldiers covered in blood, moaning from agonizing pain, who miraculously disappear once the lights turn on. Others have reported apparitions of surgeons in the halls, and maybe most disturbing is the amount of guests that have seen strange pools of blood appear on their bedding or the floor that disappear just as fast as they came into view. One guest even reported that as the elevator door opened on the hotel's second floor, the hospital was entirely in view. So it seems as though the soldiers that died in the hospital down the street took a liking to the hotel and continue to haunt all the visitors who enter to this day. In our number 10 spot, we have Roanoke, West Virginia. In a place called Roanoke in West Virginia, there is a legend that has pretty much scared the crap out of the married men in that town. What is this legend? Well, as the story goes, apparently in 1902, over the course of a week, many married men came across a woman in black. And this woman followed these men back to their homes and then disappeared when they got inside. In some of the stories around this woman, it is said that she did this due to the men being unfaithful. And some of the stories say that it was to prove that the men would be unfaithful. All of these men were of different backgrounds and social statuses. All they had in common was that they were married and they all had described the same event. Apparently though, after a week, the woman was gone from this town. But then in a town nearby, there were reports of seeing her. In our number 9 spot, we have the Peyton Randolph House. The Peyton Randolph House is located in Williamsburg. So many mysterious things seemingly happen here, and people believe it to be as a result of all of the death that has occurred there. The legend goes that an unnamed female slave cursed the house before she died, and since then, there have been too many deaths to count, from a Civil War soldier, to a young boy who fell out of a tree, to a young girl who fell from a window, to two men who were fatally hurt during a fight. People believe the property to have a poltergeist, and there have been many reports of ghostly laughing, singing, glass breaking, people being touched, pushed, and even a security guard has said he was held down with extreme force. Yeah, best not to visit this place just to be safe. In our number 8 spot we have the cursed tree. In Jamestown there is a legend of a cursed tree. Apparently there once was a girl named Sarah Harrison who was engaged, but then broke off her engagement when she met a man named James Blair, whom she then ended up marrying. This upset her parents very much so because he did not come from much money and he was also much older. When both Sarah and James died shortly after they were married, they were buried together. But not too long after, a strange thing happened. A tree began to grow and the roots separated their graves. People now believe that this was an act by her mother to separate them for eternity, but of course, this is just a theory. In our number 7 spot, we have have the Avenal House. This is a house in West Virginia that is open to paranormal teams for investigation. That's how haunted it is. There have been many people that have claimed to have captured EVPs in this house, which are electronic voice phenomena. So cool! People have confirmed hearing a cat meowing, seeing an orb that looks like an eye, smelling tobacco when no one's around, feeling dizzy, and hearing many strange noises. People have also reported seeing a fan lady in white floating down the halls or in the garden with a parasol in her hand. Sounds like a pretty classy ghost. In our number 6 spot we have Lake Shawnee Amusement Park. The Lake Shawnee Amusement Park has such a dark history that you should only visit it if you have extreme caution and are also looking to be spooked. There were quite a few people that lost their lives while the park was active from 1926 to 1966. In fact, it was because of these deaths that the park gained such a poor reputation and then ended up closing. It has also been said that the park used to be a Native American burial ground, and so it is believed that a lot of ghosts haunt this park 
because of it. Makes sense. If this ground was once a holy place where bodies were buried, I mean, that is just super sad that it was eventually turned into an amusement park. If I were one of the spirits of these bodies, I would definitely be haunting every person in that park. In our number five spot, we have 22 Mine Road. Apparently, West Virginia has a haunted road. Damn, West Virginia is seemingly filled with a lot of dark and haunted places. <laughs> Allegedly, in 1932, there was a woman by the name of Mammy Thurman who was killed and her body was thrown out and left on this road, 22 Mine Road. A man that is said to have been an illiterate handyman was charged with the crime, even though many believed that the real guy that was guilty of the crime was never found. No one quite knows where she was buried, but they say that her ghost haunts this road. In our number four spot, we have Shepherdstown. There is a town in West Virginia called Shepherdstown that is supposed to be very haunted. It's an old Civil War town though, so... Makes sense. Probably every place on this planet that has had a war near it or by it is most likely haunted. Anyways, this town is very known for its ghost tours, which is kind of fun. Many visitors have seen strange phenomena, so they might as well capitalize it. Okay, honestly, I know the title of this video says terrifying, but truly, this one actually seems kind of fun and interesting to visit. I don't know. I'm kind of in the Halloween spirit though, so that might be contributing towards my impression of this town. In our number three spot, we have St. Albans Sanatorium in Radford. St. Albans Sanatorium located in Radford has a long history of brutality. There once was a horrible massacre there where the Shawnee Indians took the lives of many of the settlers in the 1700s and took the survivors back to their village. A part of the Civil War was also there, so to say that this place has low vibes could be an understatement. The grounds were originally made to be a boys home in 1892 and specifically for tough out of control boys. Many of the boys ended up taking their own lives on the campus. It was then bought by a doctor who apparently gave very harsh psychiatric treatments in the 1900s. Many people report not only seeing ghosts at this place, but also hearing voices, getting touched, etc. Apparently there is a room with a bowling alley, which is kind of fascinating, and anyways, this place is said to have a woman ghost that is forever bowling? I'm just joking, I wish. Well, she is said to be roaming this room, so I bet you she bowls when no one's around. In our number two spot, we have the Public Hospital of Williamsburg. The Public Hospital of Williamsburg is now an art museum in West Virginia, and it is one of those places that people say gives you the creeps. It was one of the first mental hospitals in America, and so as you can imagine, many souls have walked through its doors. Apparently, it wasn't kept very well for the patients, and they were also treated pretty badly. People believe that is why it is very much haunted nowadays. At one point, there was supposedly a doctor who was trying trying to make a change in the hospital for the better and improve the lives of his patients, but then he ended up taking his own life. Many have reported seeing his ghost on the grounds as well as past patient ghosts. A lot of people speak about feeling watched while touring the hospital and that it exudes bad vibes. <sighs> well, that's terrifying and possibly a fun Halloween experience all in one. In our number one spot, we have the West Virginia State Penitentiary. Well, I saved this one for last because pretty much everyone knows about this famous prison and I wanted some of the other lesser known locations to shine first. In case you don't know about this prison, this is one of the most brutal prisons that ever existed. It was active between 1876 to 1995 and while it was active, prisoners experienced fatal beatings as well as so much violence and had their life taken by electrocution and hanging. There were many riots inside the prison and many pro protests outside of the prison to have it shut down due to the inhumane acts against the prisoners. It is said to be extremely haunted by those that lost their lives there. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Grand Union Hotel. This hotel resides in Fort Benton, which is one of the oldest towns in Montana, and it was first established by the French-American fur traders Auguste and Pierre Choteau in 1846. While much of the town has been dismantled by the years, the Grand Union Hotel still stands and it is among the oldest in the town with its initial build taking place in 1882. There are many ghost stories and haunting tales that have come from this hotel, but I will tell you one of my favorites. Apparently, this hotel might be the home to a paranormal horse. A phantom horse. It really doesn't get more interesting than that. People have reported hearing the stomping of hooves, and they believe that this horse belonged to a cowboy who, one night after having a few too many pops, tried to ride his horse up the main staircase before he was shot by the hotel manager. In our number nine 
next spot today, we have 2223 Montana Ave in Billings. This address seems a little suspiciously specific, but the story behind this haunting is quite a tragic accident. In 1945, on December 8th, an airplane that was transporting World War II soldiers who were returning home from war ended up crashing in a field east of Rocky Mountain College. 17 servicemen and two pilots lost their lives in this crash, while there were only four survivors. This is, of course, a lot of people, and at the time, it was too many for the morgue to handle at one time, so the majority of the bodies needed to be stored somewhere else for the time being. This led to 13 of the bodies being held at a refrigerated warehouse of the local grocery store located at, you guessed it, 2223 Montana Ave. This address has had many different businesses come through its doors since this tragic story occurred, and with all these businesses, the same chilling stories have remained. Employees and customers have reported seeing the ghost of a man in a World War II era military uniform inside of this location. Considering the years it's been, it doesn't seem like he's going anywhere soon. In our number 8 spot today, we have Fort Peck Theatre. This town dates back to the building of the Fort Peck Dam because the town was initially built to temporarily house the US Army Corps of Engineers, workers, and their families. In the 1930s, while building the amenities that would be needed, the Fort Peck Theatre was also built in order to provide the residents with some entertainment. The theatre is still used to this day, mostly for theatrical productions, but it's also full of paranormal entertainment as well. The theatre is said to be haunted by a male spirit who appears wearing 1930s work clothes. Some visitors even report hearing sounds of men at work even when the theatre is empty, and sometimes apparitions even appear in the dressing rooms. I just think that's the most theatre thing ever. Ghosts in the dressing rooms? Shakespeare would love that. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Boulder Hot Springs Inn and Spa. This inn is located, of course, in Boulder, and it is actually a place that dates back to a time before Montana was even a state. This now historical landmark was initially created or recognized in 1881, and it was a place where businessmen, miners, and ranchers could all go, and here they could sort of mingle with each other. In this day and age, it is said that you might still be able to mingle with those guests from all of those years ago, as legend has it, this place is highly haunted. The most well known of the ghosts here, however, is that of a woman named Simone. It is said that Simone sadly had her life taken in the hotel, and that her spirit now resides there. Visitors and staff alike have reported some really strange occurrences, like extreme temperature shifts, drastic changes in energy, and even the sound of children running through the halls when there is no one to be seen. In our number 6 spot today, we have St. Charles Hall. The oldest building on the Carroll College campus, which is located in Helena, is said to be St. Charles Hall, named after St. Charles Borromeo, who the college was actually initially named after. The building was originally constructed in 1904 and is mostly used as a dorm for students now, and those who reside in this dorm have quite the stories about the men's washroom on the fourth floor. This is said to have been the site of a horrible tale. Story goes that in 1964, a student blacked out while brushing their teeth, and as they fell, they hit their head on the sink in the bathroom. They were treated at the local hospital, but unfortunately passed from their injuries and complications. After this, students using that bathroom began to experience strange happenings. A glance in the mirror would have them seeing a young man standing behind them with a head wound. Some would turn on the faucet and see blood flowing rather than water. After years of these reports, the bathroom has apparently now been locked up and is no longer in use, but people still report hearing scraping sounds from the inside. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Many Glacier Hotel. The Many Glacier Hotel has sat in its home on the eastern shore of Swift Current Lake for over a century now, and with history like that, there is bound to be many a ghost story. Other hotels in the area too have talks and tales of hauntings, but none seem as active as the Many Glacier Hotel. A ghost hunter by the name of Karen Stevens has taken to documenting some of these paranormal stories. One of the most frightening is the tale of a young boy who apparently witnessed a woman in a red dress standing in his hotel room. Guests aren't the only ones, however. Employees too have had their own encounters. The most active room in the hotel is apparently room 308, where you can not only hear strange noises, but also see apparitions that vanish into thin air just as quickly as they appeared. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Dally Mansion. This mansion is located in Hamilton, and in its previous life, it was the farmhouse to the Copper King Marcus Daly. He purchased this home in 1886 and put it through some extensive renovations for it to become the sort of Georgian revival style that it still has today. In 1941, when Margaret Daly passed away, the house fell into disrepair after several years of being neglected, and this led to the state purchasing it in 1986. The state began restoration work on the property, and this is when many of the haunting tales started to spread. Smoking, of course, is not allowed in 
the home in this day and age, but many visitors to the home have experienced the distinct smell of a cigar smoke that seems to be coming from what was once the office of Marcus Daly. Not only this, but in the music room, there is a painting that just can't quite seem to stay on the wall, but no one has ever seen it fall off. Some even report to have seen the ghost of Mrs. Daly themselves. In our number three spot today, we have Grasshopper Glacier. This place is quite different than the others on this list, but for me, this place is the stuff of nightmares. Yeah, if you aren't a fan of bugs, you can go ahead and skip this one. If I were you, I would go. A glacier in Montana is the home to many grasshoppers and locusts. Yeah, imagine heading to a glacier, but you forgot bug spray. What a fool. Oh wait, I forgot. Grasshoppers, they don't care. They aren't mosquitoes, they're absolute savages. Appropriately named Grasshopper Glacier, the mile long glacier near Crook City holds the remains of extinct grasshoppers. The only thing worse is if they all came back to life. These guys likely were in the middle of travel when they found themselves stuck in a blizzard and now they're stuck for the foreseeable future. This is like a very forbidden version of one of those like scorpion lollipops. In our number two spot today, we have Virginia City. This town is often referred to as a ghost town due to the fact that as of 2020, the population sat just slightly over 200 people. And it is no surprise that this ghost town is said to be the home of some of Montana's most famous hauntings. Virginia City was first founded in 1863 by prospectors who originally named the area after the wife of Confederate President Jefferson Davis. The name was only changed when a judge, Judge G.G. Bissell, who was signing the town's registration, objected to the name and instead ruled it to be called Virginia. The town's population began to grow once people heard of the nearby gold deposits and discoveries. As the town grew, there wasn't sufficient law enforcement, which meant that there were a lot of vigilantes out there looking to take the law into their own hands. This led to many people who were suspected of being traveling robbers being hanged by said vigilante groups. By the time the 1940s rolled around, the town was in ruins. Charles and Sue Bovey ended up coming and buying up all the property they could, and the town now remains a tourist site, but not without some ghostly tales to spice up the story. One of the most well-known ghosts is that of a tall man in a blue Civil War soldier's coat, and he is often said to be found walking around the town's boardwalk at night, smoking as he strolls. Another one of the most famous sightings is that of a woman and a young girl. Little is known about their story, but they are often sighted by tourists. In our number one spot today, we have Deer Lodge. Deer Lodge at the old Montana Territorial Prison, now known as the Old Prison Museum, once held prisoners for over a hundred years. It apparently was quite a lousy place during that time that was full and overcrowded and had terrible food, and it was just a very dangerous place. Many inmates took each other's lives here, and with all of the stories from when this was a prison, it's just clear that if any place were to be haunted, it would absolutely be this one. There even was a huge riot that broke out in 1959. Since this prison closed down in the 1970s, the tales haven't become any less grim. Visitors report hearing eerie noises, and some have even felt the sensation of being touched. Many people believe that the ghost of convicted killer Paul Eitner, known as Turkey Pete, still haunts cell number one. He was incarcerated at the prison for 49 years before he passed away in 1967. While there are many reportedly haunted hotels in Texas, this one seems to top many lists for the most ghostly activity. Most of this seems to stem from the very chilling stories of room 525. In the 1880s, there was a young couple that was having their wedding at the hotel, or at least that was the plan. The groom got cold feet and left the bride at the altar. Now heartbroken, she ran upstairs to their suite, room 525, and took her own life. And it's said she still walks the halls in her long white gown. But that isn't the end of the story. Because in 1991, another bride was spurned at the altar, and after going on a shopping spree with the groom's stolen credit card, she too returned to room 525 and took her own life. Since then, guests have seen her carrying a pistol and walking into the room, all without ever opening the door. So don't stay in room 525 or you may never check out. There's also an eerie painting that's said to be inhabited by the spirit of a young girl, the daughter of a senator, whose expression seems to change on its own. People who view the painting have said that they feel like they were floating off of the ground, though they remained on the floor. They also say that their equilibrium and balance was off for a few hours after looking at her. Number 9, USS Lexington, Corpus Christi. 
Now before I tell you about this spooky ship, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you can catch all of our amazing videos. As a naval vessel that saw actual battle, there have been multiple lives that were lost on board, including that of an engine room operator who still roams the ship at night waiting for the battle to end. The crew of the ship have often reported flickering lights and doors slamming on their own, which given that this is a very well maintained historical site, you'd think that they would have found the cause by now. Maybe it's just the ghosts of sailors lost to time. Coming in at number 8, we have the Marfa lights in, you guessed it, the town of Marfa. While there is so much beauty in the area and plenty of non-spooky reasons to visit, the main tourist attraction to this quaint little town are floating, sourceless lights that seem to change color and even move in the night sky. Many visitors make the journey at all times of year to see the lights, and there's even a yearly festival made in their honor. Reported since 1883 by people of all ages and professions, no one knows what these floating orbs are. They appear at random, but usually in the same area of the sky, and since there's so much open space and low light pollution, it's perfect for stargazing, or seeing spooky orbs I guess. <laughs> some say that these lights are UFOs, some say spirits, and others think that they're just headlights. All that I know is that if I see a mysterious floating orb, I'm going the other way. Number 7. Woman Hollering Creek, San Antonio Said to be the home of La Llorona, or the Weeping Woman, this creepy creek leaves anyone who visits with a sense of dread. As the story goes, La Llorona was a woman who was distraught that her once doting, affectionate husband left her for another woman. And after confronting him and leaving the confrontation with cuts and bruises, she waded into the water, dressed in her best clothes, and drowned herself in the creek right after doing the same to the rest of her family. Her chilling screams for her children can be heard all the way from the highway, giving her and the creek its very apt name. Many people have felt themselves being drawn towards the water by ghostly voices, and some have even been tugged towards the bank of the creek. Perhaps it's La Llorona looking for her next victim. The screams heard and feelings of being pulled into the water have mostly been reported by younger people, making this all the more terrifying given what La Llorona did. Number 6. El Paso High School Now, when you're thinking of haunted places, a school isn't exactly the first place that comes to mind, but this one has quite a story. In 1985, the graduating class received their yearbooks, and when basking in the nostalgia of their group photo, they noticed something odd. A woman who no one could identify was in the picture with them. Now, obviously, that would be quite concerning. I know I'd be freaked out if there was someone I'd never seen before standing next to me in a picture. The blurry apparition still has not been identified to this day, but some think it's a student who fell from a window years before who never got to graduate. I say give her the diploma. She's already in the yearbook. Sticking in El Paso, in our number 5 spot is the Plaza Theatre Performing Arts Center. As someone who loves the theater, I try to see as many shows as I can, but I think I'll skip visiting this theater, no matter how good the production is. Built in 1930 as a movie house, demolished for a parking lot in the late 80s and rebuilt as a live theater space, this building has seen many, many changes, but some things have stayed constant throughout its history. Many workers of the building have reported seeing a man in one of the box seats, in a tuxedo, smoking a cigarette. One crew member recalls seeing him after turning on the stage lights, sitting alone in the box, as though he'd been there for hours already before the lights came on. And when she saw the smoking man, he turned to her and said, We all have our time to die, and then threw himself headfirst over the balcony, vanishing before he could hit the ground. A former vice president of the theater also recalls seeing a ghostly girl bouncing a ball in the aisles of the theater and always staring. He also noticed that there was a rag doll that seemed to appear and disappear on its own, moving to locations that it couldn't have without someone's help. Even locked doors didn't seem to stop it from appearing in the projection booth. Number 4. Yorktown Memorial Hospital Established in 1951, this abandoned hospital has been named one of the most haunted places in America. And since over 2,000 patients are said to have died within its walls before it shuttered its doors in 1992, I can see why. Reports of apparitions of people in hospital gowns running through the corridors or hiding in rooms are numerous, along with moving wheelchairs, disembodied voices, and footsteps. But there are some who have even more chilling stories. While exploring the halls and rooms that have remained largely untouched since its closure, some ghost hunters have been touched, had their clothes tugged on, or even pushed to the ground while being given a ghostly warning. 
Some of the spirits are believed to be that of patients who had illegal medical experiments performed on them and lost their lives in the process, making for a very vengeful ghost. Number 3. The Screaming Bridge in Arlington On the night of February 4th, 1961, six from the local high school were taking a drive after seeing a movie earlier in the evening. While driving down Bedford Road toward the rail crossing bridge, which had mysteriously been burned down a few years previous, only rebuilt earlier that year, they were startled by another car reversing and honking its horn wildly. This caused the driver to speed up out of fear and, not realizing that the bridge was out, the car careened over the edge and crashed into the other side of the ravine. Unfortunately, three of them lost their lives that night, and their screams of terror can still be heard by anyone traveling the renamed Greenbelt Road. The saddest part of this story is that the car that startled them was being driven by a man who had just barely avoided going over the edge of the broken bridge himself, and he was reversing and honking to warn them of the danger ahead. The entire area, now known as Death Crossing, is now blocked off and no traffic travels through. At number 2 on our list, we have La Carafe in Houston. This historic bar, built originally as a bakery in 1860, has been serving patrons for decades. But many come not only for the drinks, but for a paranormal experience. Bartenders and visitors alike have seen apparitions of a hulking man walking upstairs and hearing his giant footsteps pacing the floor. No one knows who this may be, but some say he died there from some nefarious means. The former manager of the bar can also be seen staring out of the top floor window, looking over his patrons and ensuring they're having a good time. And he seems a bit more friendly. <laughs> However, there are some that report the sounds of a body being dragged across the floor above, but when the sound is followed, nothing's there. Makes you wonder what happened upstairs. And since it's one of the oldest buildings in the city that's been in continuous use, it's become a tourist hotspot and a historical site. Personally, I won't be stopping in for a drink anytime soon, no matter how good the cocktails are. And finally, number one, the Alamo. While students are taught to remember the Alamo, they don't really teach about all of the spirits who can never forget. In the infamous battle, thousands of soldiers lost their lives, and many were dumped into mass graves and others left to rot out in the sun, so it makes sense that you'd have some pissed off ghosts wandering the ground. There have been countless reports of soldier apparitions walking with weapons in hand, taking their usual patrol, and even full platoons screaming and charging into battle. Even in the afterlife they couldn't get away from war, and so they continue to fight their invisible enemy. There are also accounts of a small blonde haired boy hiding in multiple places where the gift shop now stands, so make sure to pick up your haunted keychains. While the buildings are beautiful to look at and the area is interesting to explore, the history can leave one with a haunting feeling, and with all those spirits around, I'd be careful touring here, especially at night. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Number 10, The Hanging Jail. Actually called the Beauregard Parish Jail, it opened in 1915 and it was actually kind of a big deal because it had extraordinary amenities for a jail. Each cell had a window and a bathroom and cells on the top floor even had a skylight. But despite its beautiful architecture, it was also the site of Louisiana's first double execution. In 1926, two men were committed after killing and robbing a taxi driver and sentenced to be hanged. They claimed innocence, but still the verdict passed and the two men died in the jail, giving it the infamous name. It remained open until 1981 and now a museum, it's believed to be haunted by the two men along with other inmates who felt they were unjustly put behind bars. Many have reported being pushed or hearing voices while visiting, and some have even captured photos of strange, inexplicable, shadowy figures lurking on the porch and window, leaving no other explanation than to assume the jail remains a haunted and terrifying place to visit. Coming in at number 9, 
Pleasant Hall. This story has two versions, so I will let you decide which one you think is true. Once upon a time, while attending the Louisiana State University, a resident tragically took her life in the now infamous Room 312. One story says the girl killed her boyfriend in a fit of rage and then, shocked at her actions, took her own life because she could not live with what she had done. The other story claims the girl jumped out of the window of her room and fell to her impending doom, terrifying the students on campus that witnessed the horrifying sight. But which one really happened? Well, it seems that is the hard part to find out. But what's not difficult to know is that the spirit of the girl remains, haunting Pleasant Hall to this day. Students have reported seeing her ghost roam the campus and hearing strange noises coming from the other side of room 312. And sometimes at night, when you least expect it, the door to room 312 will open and shut all on its own. Coming in at number 8, St. Louis Cemetery number 1. Regarded as the city of the dead, the St. Louis Cemetery number 1 holds more ghost stories than you'd want to encounter in a lifetime. In the span of a mere block, the cemetery has over 700 tombs and over 100,000 bodies are known to be buried at the site. Most famously, it is the burial site of Voodoo Queen Marie Laveau, the most revered and feared practitioner in New Orleans history. Reports of her ghost have detailed her in her signature red and white turban and claim she will suddenly appear out of nowhere and then vanish from plain sight just as fast. Visitors have experienced scratching, pinching, shoving, suddenly becoming ill, and even hearing her haunting voice echo across the cemetery, sending many that have dared to visit running for the hills. So just be careful if you choose to stop by. If you aren't careful, she could curse you for life. Next up at number 7, the Calcasia Courthouse. The history of capital punishment is a torrid one, and as it turns out, this courthouse is actually famous for just that. Back in the 1940s, there was a woman named Tony Jo McHuston. She lived quite a tumultuous life involved in drugs and her local brothel, but one day she fell in love with a man who frequented her establishment named Claude Henry. And so they got married and she started to really turn her life around. But after Claude was sent to jail for 50 years for killing someone, something inside Tony snapped. She planned to bust Claude out of jail with a friend, but in the process of stealing a car, killed the owner and left him in a ditch. She was caught and sentenced to death and would become the first first ever woman to be executed by the electric chair in Louisiana. It said her spirit still haunts the courthouse, locking doors and messing around with the filing systems during the day. But steer clear at night, as residents report you can smell her burning hair and hear her unruly screams echo through the streets. Coming in at number 6, Pea Farm. Nicknamed the Pea Farm, it is not actually a farm nor does it have anything to do with peas. It is, however, an an old abandoned prison. The facility was in operation between 1905 to 1950, and rumor has it that life was incredibly rough and difficult at the pea farm for prisoners, even more so than your typical prison. Beatings and lashings were commonplace, and even killing of prisoners was nothing to bat an eye at. So it's no surprise that those whose life may have ended here have stuck around, maybe trying to seek revenge on those who hurt them. Today, the prison is strictly off limits to visitors, but those that walk past have reported hearing shrieks and other strange noises coming from inside the abandoned building. Maybe no one is allowed for a good reason. Next up at number 5, Bonnie and Clyde's Ambush Site. Maybe you've heard of the infamous couple, but just in case you haven't, let me catch you up. They were notorious bank robbers across Louisiana and Texas during the Great Depression in America and made quite a name for themselves. In recent years, it has been suggested their exploits were exaggerated, but one thing that wasn't is how they died. The day was May 23rd, 1934, and police from both Louisiana and Texas managed to corner them in their stolen car. Authorities fired more than a hundred bullets at the couple, and as the story goes, you could hear Bonnie's scream from the next town over. Residents claim that if you visit the site of their death, the ghosts of the couple will make themselves well known to you. Apparitions have shown in photographs and some have even heard what they believe to be Bonnie's scream as she took her last few breaths on this earth. Coming in at number 4, 
Oak Alley. Once upon a time, it was one of the largest plantations in Louisiana. And just like every other of its kind, it has a dark past. Since its dark days, it has turned into a bed and breakfast and historical site, but the people that were tortured remain, haunting the ground and terrorizing visitors. Numerous accounts have claimed to hear unexplained sounds like blood curdling screams in the middle of the night or the sound of a horse drawn carriage clopping along the path. Some visitors have even experienced being touched or grabbed by an unseen entity and one investigator got so scared he dropped his camera while trying to capture a spirit. Paranormal investigators have managed to capture several EVPs that indicate unhappy ghosts lingering the property and though no one has been hurt staying here yet, tread carefully as you never know just when you could set the spirits off. Coming in at number 3. Alice's grave. Alice died in the 19th century, and although she had a fairly normal life while alive, her death and afterlife were anything but expected. She was laid to rest in an above ground grave, but soon after, many of the townspeople began to question was the grave haunted? Or worse, was Alice a witch? As the legend goes, in the middle of the night, the large slab of marble covering her grave was removed on three separate occasions, and each time, her remains were left outside the grave. No one stepped forward admitting to have moved Alice or the slab, which led people to believe that Alice was a witch trying to escape her grave and haunt the town. Eventually, large iron bars were placed over the grave in an attempt to hold her spirit inside. But this hasn't seemed to stop her, as locals claim you can still see her wandering the cemetery at night. But just exactly what is she looking for? That is one of the many unanswered questions that leave visitors terrified, unsure if she comes in peace or if she is out for revenge. Next up at number 2, the Manchac Swamp. While many are familiar with the legendary voodoo priestess Marie Laveau, she was not the only one of her time. Julia Brown was a well respected healer and midwife who resided in a small village called Frenier. At first, she loved caring for her village, but after some time, she started to feel disrespected by her community, feeling as though they were taking her gifts for granted. Julia began scaring the village, telling them dooming predictions about their impending deaths, and the townspeople, unsure if she was placing a curse or foretelling their future, became very troubled. Shortly before her own death, she said, One day I'm gonna die and I'm gonna take all you with me. And just days after she was buried, three entire villages were destroyed by a hurricane and hundreds of lives were lost. To this day, many believe the spirit of Julia Brown haunts the swamp, and visitors have reported hearing blood curdling screams and the sound of her voice singing cryptic and frightening songs, terrifying all those that dare walk by. And last up in our number one spot, La Lorie Mansion. Arguably one of the most infamous buildings in all of Louisiana, La Lorie Mansion was once home to the cruel and torturous Madame Delphine La Lorie. Even in her time, she was regarded as a monster and was known to have her slaves taken from her on more than one occasion due to their their outrageous mistreatment. In 1834, a fire broke out in her mansion, and when police and fire marshals arrived at the site, they found one of her slaves chained to the stove, claiming to have started the fire to try and take her own life to escape the cruelty. Another seven victims were found in her attic, suspended from the ceiling, mutilated and barely alive, stating to have been imprisoned for months. Once news broke out of her cruelties, citizens attacked the house and demolished everything they could. While the original building no longer stands, the grounds it stood on are some of the most haunted in all of Louisiana, as it's believed nearly 100 people lost their lives under Madame Delphine's cruel supervision. Visitors have reported feeling the violent touches of ghostly hands, and a medium that visited stated that there is a very dark demonic entity that resides within the building's walls. So just tread carefully. Carefully. Should you choose to visit, the spirits that live there are not too thrilled by visitors in their home. And we're starting off with West Castleton. I have always wanted to go to a ghost town. I think it would be 
like really eerie, fun at the same time. And the town of West Castleton on Lake Bommelsine has long been abandoned. What once used to be a busy, bustling industrial town has been empty since the 1930s and there are many who claim that the area is teeming with ghostly apparitions. There is one tale about two men who once took their boat out to visit a tavern in town but were never seen from again. The only remnants of the men was their empty rowboat found floating alone in Lake Bomosine the following day. Some say that on some nights when the moon is full to have seen an empty semi-translucent rowboat silently making its way across the water towards the abandoned town on the other side of the lake. If you're liking the uh, channel, guys, don't forget to comment and subscribe. It really helps us out more than you probably know. All right. On to number nine. At number nine, we have Montpellier Cemetery, more specifically the Black Agnes statue, sitting atop the grave of John Hubbard, a notorious crook in the late 1800s who swindled his way into gaining his aunt's inheritance, which was meant to go to the city. He received his aunt's estate to the frustration of the city leaders, but died of liver cancer just a few years later. This statue is pretty famous for being one of the most haunted items in the state of Vermont and just looking at it doesn't really surprise me much. I don't really believe in curses myself. I've never been cursed, at least that I know of, and I've never successfully cursed anyone else, though I have tried on a number of occasions, but looking at a statue like this, I could see why people would feel a little uneasy around it, especially upon learning that the statue is meant to be the personification of death itself, the Greek god Thanatos. It is said that if you sit on the statue's lap, you'll be met with misfortune, and if you dare sit upon it on a full moon at midnight, you will die within a week. Next on the list, we have the Brattleboro Retreat Tower. This beautiful gothic tower sits on the grounds of Brattleboro Retreat, which is a mental health facility that still operates today, but was originally built as an asylum in 1834. This particular tower was constructed between 1887 and 1894 by patients of the asylum, with doctors believing they would benefit from physical labor, and the tower still remains, now standing abandoned. That tower has a bit of a dark history. History, though, there were said to be multiple cases of patients having taken their lives from the top of the tower, and in the 1920s and 30s, there were multiple shootings surrounding the tower that finally led to its entrance being boarded up in 1938. Those who visit the structure today claim to feel an eerie presence, even reporting having seen ghostly apparitions plummeting from the top. If I ever find myself in the area, uh, I'd love to check it out. Aside from the ghost stuff, I. I just be really cool to hang out by this gothic tower in the middle of a forest. Glastonbury Mountain, located in Bennington County's Green Mountain National Forest, has been the breeding ground for all sorts of paranormal activity. If you decide to traverse the mountain, you just might happen across a Sasquatch or, or spot a UFO in the sky. There's even an Algonquin legend about a stone that devours people. And if all that isn't enough to pique your interest, the area is also said to be cursed. Five hikers known to have gone missing in the area between 1945 to 1950. Only one body was ever found and the cause of death was never determined. There have also been uh, so, so many strange occurrences in the area. It's often referred to as the Bennington Triangle, like the Bermuda Triangle. See, you get it. Number six, the Dutton House in Shelburne Museum. Shelburne Museum uh, is a collection of various historical buildings, most of which have been moved to the property from other locations. And one of these structures is the Dutton House. The home was built by the Dutton family in Cavendish, Vermont in 1781. And 11 people are thought to have died in the home and uh, it was left abandoned for decades before being moved to the museum in 1950. Staff say they've seen some pretty strange things in there, like the sound of a little girl crying, which isn't a sight, that's a, something you hear, James. Anyway, uh, but they've also seen ghostly faces in windows. Some visitors claim they've heard eerie whispers in the halls and felt an icy chill running down their spines. And there have been sightings of a transparent figure roaming the house at night. They say it's the ghost of the original owner who passed away. Some folks reckon he and his family are still lingering around. They're refusing to leave the home. Some staff are so creeped out by the place that they just refuse to go inside it entirely. Next we have Green Mountain Inn. 
This inn is said to be haunted by one primary apparition, that being Boots Berry, located in Stowe. This beautiful inn, built back in 1833, pretty picturesque. Honestly, if I ever take a trip to Stowe, this is where I want to stay. But you may find yourself rooming with an extra guest. Boots Berry was said to have been born in the hotel, the son of two employees. As he grew up, he developed a, a drinking problem, though, and was eventually kicked out of the inn. Landed himself in a prison in New York. Orleans, but soon returned to Stowe where he supposedly fell to his death off the roof of the Green Mountain Inn, where he apparently loved to uh, tap dance. So some say on some nights they can hear the sounds of his tap dancing feet on the roof. Others claim to have actually seen a full-bodied apparition of Boots making his way down the corridors of the inn. Number four, Norwich University. Some dark things are said to have happened in the walls of this prestigious institution with its gorgeous campus nestled among the rolling hills and has a reputation of being haunted. There's a boarded up dorm room where a long time ago, two students were said to have taken their lives. Students and staff have reported hearing strange noises and, and voices emanating from the supposedly empty room. Then you have Chaplin Hall, the former library where Books were said to fly and float off the shelves. Nowadays, residents report seeing strange figures roaming the hallway. You also have two other areas of the school that are supposedly plagued by paranormal activity, Ranson and Hawkins Hall. Many students have reported waking up, unable to move or breathe, feeling like something is sitting on their chest. Sleep paralysis, it can be pretty unsettling, but I doubt there's anything paranormal going on there, especially for stressed out university students, but hey, I, I guess you never really truly know. Next up, we have Marble Inn, located in Fairhaven, Vermont. This inn is said to have a few different spirits that reside within the building. It was built in 1867, and one of the previous owners apparently passed away in the tea room, and apparently he was pretty upset about it too, because now he, as well as a couple other ghosts, supposedly haunt the place. Many guests have reported waking up to see the figure of a man in a gray suit standing at the foot of their bed. There was also an instance where a repairman was working on the basement and suddenly spotted a woman standing behind him, but she just remained silent before walking into another room. Pearman was obviously pretty confused, but he followed the woman into the room. When he entered it, there was nobody there. Classic ghost story, just an empty, dark room. I wonder what the rest of this workday was like after that. How do you just go back to what you were doing after experiencing something like that? Like if I saw a ghost, I'd just change everything for me. Oh. Ghosts, I guess they just exist now. Well, that completely changes my entire outlook on life. What happens after death? What is reality? Am I just am I just hallucinating things now? Am I someone who hallucinates? What is going on? Anyway, these pipes, they're not gonna fix themselves. Back to work. Number two, the Bowman House, aka Laurel Hall, regarded as one of the most haunted places in Vermont. The first owner of the home, John Bowman, is buried at, in a mausoleum on the property along with the rest of his family, each of whom died tragically. Locals swear they've seen shadowy figures moving about the rooms and strange noises echo through the halls at night. Some say they hear the disembodied cry of a baby, which would really freak and irk me out, quite frankly. I can't stand babies crying in public as it is. Uh, they seem to show up everywhere I go for some reason. So last thing I need in my life is a wailing ghost baby now. Some people who visit the home even claim to have seen the ghostly figure of Mrs. Bowman standing at the top of the stairs. There are whispers of disembodied voices calling out in despair and ghostly stuff going on. Some folks claim they've even witnessed objects moving on their own. Basically, some people think it's haunted is, is what I'm getting at here. Number one, we have Gold Brick Bridge, aka Emily's Bridge. Emily's Bridge in Vermont is infamous for its spooky reputation as a haunted hotspot. Not only is it said to be the most haunted place in the state of Vermont, but one of the most haunted bridges in the United States. This old covered bridge has a tale that'll send shivers down your spine. The story goes that Emily 
A young lady, head over heels in love, planned to elope with her sweetheart at the bridge. But for some reason, the guy just totally ditched her. Devastated and heartbroken, Emily decided to end her own life. Ever since that fateful day, folks claim to have experienced some pretty creepy stuff around Emily's bridge. Ghostly sightings, weird noises, the feeling of being watched, and mysterious footsteps. Those are just the, the tip of the iceberg, though. This lady gets physical. People find scratches on their cars. Some who dare to cross the bridge on foot have reported being grabbed or scratched themselves. And you know what? I gotta say, getting grabbed and scratched by a feisty female ghost? I don't hate the sound of that. Might have to book my ticket out there. Starting us off with number 10 are the Vampire Brothers. Has anyone seen the originals or the Vampire Diaries? I feel like these legends sort of remind me of that plotline with vampires in New Orleans, etc. But anyway, during the 30s, brothers John and Wayne Carter lived somewhere in the French Quarter of New Orleans. During the day, they worked as laborers and tried to keep to themselves as much as possible. But one day, a woman somehow escaped from their apartment, bleeding as she went because her wrists had been slit. Police later found multiple other people tied to chairs with their wrists slit in their apartment alongside dozens of dead bodies that had no blood. The story was that the brothers kidnapped the people to drink their blood every night after work. It took more than eight police officers to hold down and catch the brothers before they were executed and buried. But the weirdest part was that years later when another carter in the family was being buried, the brothers' bodies had vanished from the vault. Legend goes on to say you can still see them roaming around New Orleans today and someone who owned their apartment years ago said he once saw two figures that matched their description whispering to each other and then jumping off a third floor balcony. That's basically the original's plotline, it's not even funny. Maybe it was based on this, it probably was and I just don't know. Coming in at number 9 is the La Prette Massacre. I'm just loving these, they're just so juicy. Louisiana is full with so many legends, I just love this. But anyway, towards the latter half of the 1800s, a rich man from Turkey owned La Prette House and also claimed he was a disposed sultan. The man transformed the house into an eastern pleasure palace essentially. The doors and windows were blocked with bars, incense filled the air, and men guarded the house as well. The gates were locked so the place really was like an inescapable fortress. The house even had a harem filled with girls of all ages as well as young boys too. If that wasn't enough cause for alarm, one morning neighbours saw blood trickling out from under the iron gates. The police were called straight away and they forced open the doors to a scene of pure horror. Blood was everywhere. All over the walls and floors there were amputated limbs, headless bodies, and all the harem girls and guys, even the guards had been sexually assaulted. And you'd think it was the Turk who had gone insane, but he was also found mutilated and buried alive somewhere on the property. As to the perpetrators, people think that maybe they were a pirate's crew that had unfinished business with the man, or maybe the Turk's own family. But can you imagine? There was so much blood it was oozing out of the property. That's horrific. Anyone staying in the house after that has seen people in eastern clothing roaming the halls and even sounds of footsteps supposedly from all the people who have died there. At number 8 we have the Grunge. So the east of New Orleans was mostly just woodland initially and legend has it a group of humans called the Grunge used to live in those woods. They were said to be a mix of dwarves and albinos who were forced to live there because people thought they were made by the devil but then they inbred into something else completely. People said their offspring became inhuman in appearance. Grunge rose was meant to be a place where teens could go to make out if they weren't scared, but people started to go missing. Some goats and then actual people, all drained of blood and dead. And as this was happening, more and more strange deformed creatures started being seen. Apparently people believe that the people in the forest sold their souls for a beast that could protect them from everyone in society, whereas others believed after years of receiving cruel treatment, they just went insane. They were murderous and cannibalistic, and it's said that if you see a stray goat that looks like it needs help near those parts, you shouldn't stop because it's just a trap. Filling our number 7 slot is Marie Laveau. Sorry if my French accent's bad, it probably is. And if you've seen American Horror Story Coven, then you already know who this woman is. Born in 1801, Marie was a central figure in New Orleans famous for voodoo. She had a lot of power and prestige and worked as a hairdresser which essentially meant she basically knew the secrets of everyone in town. Rich, poor, black, white, she knew it all about everyone. She was the first person to mix voodoo 
voodoo with Catholicism to form a new religion that's still practiced today. It's called New Orleans Voodoo. The legend goes that although Marie died in 1881, she resurrects every year on St. John's Eve to lead the faithful in worship. Her ghost, as well as her daughter's ghost, who continued her magic after she died, have been spotted numerous times around New Orleans. Now, at number six is the Rue Guru or the Loop Guru. Now, this is a legend that's been passed down from generation to generation. This creature is meant to be like a werewolf of sorts and is a pale white colour. It wanders the streets during the night looking for a hero, which is a bit of a plot twist. It causes havoc in crowds until someone stabs or shoots it. When the first drop of blood comes out of it, the Rue Guru turns back into a man and tells the person his real name. He'll go on to warn the hero that they can't mention the incident to anyone for a full year or they too will become a Rue Guru themselves. Mostly parents tell their children about the tale to stop them from misbehaving, but it is apparently true. Coming in at number 5 is Madame Minier Canal, I think. Probably not. <laughs> now, she wasn't famous or anyone well known, and I don't think anyone would have known who she was today if she hadn't committed suicide on the third floor of her house. She hung herself from an overhead beam, but before doing it, she also killed her own small white dog. And after that, and after World War II, the house was sold to the grandparents of someone called Ramon. The Ramon said growing up, when him and his siblings were misbehaving, their punishment would be sitting alone on the staircase going up to the third floor. He remembered that every time he he did that, he saw a woman wearing a white dress that he just didn't recognize, and she always had with her a small white dog. One night, he woke the whole house because he was screaming in his room. When the lights came on in his bedroom, his cheek was bright red because someone had slapped him in his sleep. Even his father met her. He climbed into bed one night hoping to hug his wife, but instead was hugging this ghost. They saw a woman standing over one of the babies' cribs, and they could see through her. They even used to hear barking from the third floor when they definitely did not have a dog. Haunting confirmed. At number 4 is Count Saint Germain. Now Count Saint Germain was the epitome of a vampire, or what you've been told is a vampire based off you know, stuff like Twilight. He spoke 6 languages, was a master at the violin and piano, and he also composed his own music. He was insanely rich even though no one knew where his wealth came from, but he claimed he was the son of Francis II who was the Prince of Transylvania. So his wealth could have been from being royalty, but no one even knew anything about his family or lineage. There was just no information about him. But supposedly he was very skilled at alchemy and had figured out how to attain immortality. He looked around 40 years old in all his portraits and that look lasted for over half a century. And no one's 40 for that long honey. Even at social dinners, no one ever saw him eat. He would just sip wine and speak about things that just made you feel inferior. He died in 1784 but there have been countless stories of people having seen him after that. In the 20th century, a man moved to New Orleans called Jacques. Saint Germain who looked exactly like the Count and had the same wealth and knowledge. Again having dinner parties but only ever sipping wine. Apparently one night a woman stayed late at his house and he tried to bite her neck but she escaped and reported it to the police. When they went to investigate he was nowhere to be found. What they did find was cloths with blood on them and bottles of wine. And the policemen decided to pour themselves wine but found that the wine wasn't just wine, it was wine mixed with human blood. Vampire confirmed. Now at number 2 are the casket girls. Now because of the reputation that New Orleans had back in the day, treacherous, some of the highest murder rates, notorious for missing persons, the area had trouble getting women to move there. And I mean rightfully so. Most men there were originally sent there because they were murderers, thieves, culprits of any crime really. But thankfully there was a boat full of women coming that the French had convinced to move to the city during colonization, but they all abandoned ship in Mobile, Alabama. Now these girls were called the casket girls because they carried small chests with them, but the chests were shaped like mini coffins. So when most of them escaped the boat, they left behind 300 coffins. Most of them were said to be empty, but some were rumored to contain the bodies of the undead, aka vampires. They were also nailed shut because they had a habit of opening themselves, which is just already suspicious. Later in 1978, a pair of reporters wanted to see the coffins, but the convent's priest said no. So the reporters climbed over the wall one night with all their equipment to see the coffins in real life. The next day their equipment was thrown over the street outside and on the front steps of the convent were their decapitated bodies, as well as 80% of their blood gone and no one knows what happened to them. I mean, 
their theories. And finally, at number one is La Lorie House. And I feel like this story has been in so many shows and movies, so most people probably do know about this one, but it's still a key legend from Louisiana. Located at 1140 Royal Street, this house is still one of the most haunted houses in New Orleans. During the 1800s, Dr. Louis La Lorie and his wife Delphine were known for always hosting lavish dinners there. She was charismatic and well respected, but Delphine had a sadistic dark side. The house had dozens of slaves and she used to torture every single one of them. Due to cruelty laws, some of her slaves were auctioned off, but she just made her relatives buy them back for her in secret. She kept her cook, changed the fireplace for one, and she chased a young girl off the roof of her house with a whip. People started becoming suspicious when they started noticing that the slaves came and went quite quickly at the house, and some just straight up disappeared. Her neighbor actually saw the slave girl jumping to her death from the roof, and so rumors went around more and more, and people started declining invitations to the house. House. In 1834, a massive fire broke out in the house, supposedly started by the cook, and it went through the whole house. Honestly, if I was the cook, I would have done a lot more than just arson. But anyway, after the blaze was out, firefighters found a door, a secret barred door in the attic that hid more than a dozen other slaves. They were all chained to the wall, locked in dog cages, or strapped to makeshift operating tables. Body parts were all around the floor, heads, intestines, all of it, just in buckets around the room. Their treatment was horrible. Women had their stomachs sliced open and their intestines were wrapped around their waists. One woman had animal poo in her mouth and then it was sewn shut. There were a lot more but I'll just leave it there. And either way, it was known that Delphine acted alone and a mob gathered outside her house but she and her family vanished. Some say they went to France or wherever but haunting started at the house as soon as they fled. Cries, groans, everything was heard and finding anyone to live there was nearly impossible. Starting us off at number 10, the Old Red Field Road. Said to be extremely active with spirits, keep your eyes peeled if you ever find yourself driving down this road. Those that try find that their flashlights and radios suddenly stop working, and some even say their cars begin acting up as soon as they start to approach. One driver in fact said that the hood of their car flew open on site, and when they went to go and check it out, there was no explanation for why it would have done that. Visitors claim that countless ghosts roam the road walking up and down, likely coming from the nearby cemetery, and that they feel a sense of deep unsettling anxiety until they turn off the old Redfield Road. So maybe if you do visit, just find an alternate route. Next up at number 9, Cotter Bridge. Located in a small town of less than 900 people, during the day the bridge is a world renowned hotspot for trout fishing, visited by residents and tourists alike. But things take a turn after the sun goes down and locals say that this bridge is haunted by some truly terrifying spirits. Residents say that at night you can hear the cries of an infant coming from the bridge and the sounds of young people playing for hours and hours. But most haunting of all is the woman who can be seen sprinting from vicious hounds. No one knows who she is or why she's being chased, but the fear of her screaming voice has scared residents from ever daring to get too close. Coming in at number 8. Fort Smith Courthouse. During the late 19th century, Fort Smith was the site of many sentenced to be hanged. In fact, it was rather notorious for it as the presiding judge at the time, named Isaac C. Parker, got the nickname The Hanging Judge from sentencing a whopping 160 people to their death, 79 of which received the punishment. The hangings happened outside the courthouse in the gallows, perhaps as a warning sign for all to see what happened to criminals and it's believed the condemned men of the jail still roam the grounds seeking revenge on Isaac Parker. Many today say they've had frightening experiences while at the courthouse, especially in the gallows. Visitors claim to have heard gavels banging, seen ropes swinging when there was no wind, and one groundskeeper even claims to have spoken with the ghost of Isaac Parker himself. Next up at number 7, the Clayton House. Originally built in the 1800s as a Civil War hospital, it wasn't until 1882 when William Clayton moved his family into the now historical home. The family seemed to have 
have a fairly happy life in their home, but I guess with roots as a hospital, ghosts flock to it and continue to haunt it to this day. The former director of the site, Martha, says that as soon as she started working there, she knew something was off. Doors would slam in the middle of the night, she would hear footsteps from down the hall when no one was there, and one room on the second floor would always sound like music was playing from inside. Then in 2008, a carpenter who was doing some repairs on the building took pictures to keep track of the progress, but when those photos got developed, he saw a woman dressed in brown lurking in the back of one of his photos. And he wasn't the only one to claim to have seen her lurking in the corners. After a while, Clayton's house had kind of a reputation, and so paranormal investigators started visiting. And using EVPs, they got recordings of a man shouting obscenities at someone named Anna, which piqued their interest as one of Clayton's daughters was named Anne. But maybe most terrifying was one woman who says that she was standing by herself in the hotel when her hair was tugged hard. She turned around to see who had snuck up on her, assuming it was a prank, but no one was around and she was all alone. Next up at number 6, the Toltec Mounds. A hiking trail might not be the first place you'd expect to be terrifyingly haunted, but it makes much more sense once you know that it leads through the remains of an ancient civilization. More officially referred to as the Plum Bayou Mounds, there were once home to a large group of people beginning around 600 AD. But what no one has been able to figure out since is their sudden and mysterious disappearance in 1050 AD. It's thought that the mounds were used for a variety of different purposes, but we know for sure that at least one was a burial ground, and as you can imagine, that is where most of the ghost sightings have occurred. Visitors who pass through the trail say they've seen strange apparitions of what looked like ancient people, along with mysterious orbs of light popping out of nowhere. And some say that if you walk by at night, you'll hear foot stomps of the ancient civilization that will send you running as far away as you can. Coming in Number 5, The Basin Park Hotel. This hotel has long been the site of many paranormal sightings, although no one knows exactly why so many ghosts conjugate in this building. One belief is because the hotel possesses magical abilities, due to the famous spring waters that it's built beside. During the 1800s, the indigenous people of the area talked about their holy springs, and it led many to believe that Eureka Springs had healing powers that could cure ailments and crippling conditions. Maybe these holy waters are what make the spirits more visible to the human eye today. Most famously in room 307 lies the ghost of a cowboy who's been known to taunt the guests who stay there, waking them up in the middle of the night. Other entities that visitors claim to have witnessed are the young, translucent woman with steel blue eyes and cotton candy blonde hair, as well as a girl who runs around in pigtails and a yellow dress. Those that stay say they often see various orbs of light appearing around around the grounds as if out of nowhere, and that objects will move all on their own very frequently. So if I were you, I'd just find a different hotel to stay at on your visit. Coming in at number 4, The King Opera House. While it's safe to assume you'd expect some kind of drama at the opera, usually it's left to the actors on stage. Said to be haunted by the ghost of a young actor named Charles Tolson, many believe they've seen the famous man roam the halls where he had his last performance ever. As the story goes, Tolson was a talented young man, an owner of a traveling actors company that happened to be performing at the King Opera House for a week at the end of September in 1903. Tolson caught the eye of a young woman named Allie Parchman, who was just 17 but bored to death by her town and looking for adventure. But Allie's father got word that she intended to leave town with the young man and elope, and this made him furious. Her father ran down to the opera house to confront Tolson and kill him. When he arrived, he shot him three times, and although Tolson didn't die then, his life was over by the next day while in the hospital. Visitors of the opera house say they feel a strange sensation when they enter, like they're being watched 
constantly, and some even claim to have witnessed him lurking the halls in his Victorian cape and top hat. Next up at number 3, the Crescent Hotel and Spa. Not only is this Victorian beauty believed to be one of the most haunted places in Arkansas, but some have even said it might be one of the most haunted places in all of America. Before its time as a haunted hotel, it was a hospital run by a crooked doctor who fooled his cancer patients into thinking that there was a cure. So as you can imagine, it's riddled with spirits with a vengeance. Over the years, countless guests and staff have come forward telling their tales, claiming to have heard strange sensations, slamming doors, abrupt waking in the middle of the night, and even seeing full bodied apparitions while staying in room 218. It is believed that the room is haunted by the ghost of Michael, who was a builder for the hotel that fell off the roof to his death back in 1885 and landed right in front of where room 218 sits. Others claim they've seen a middle aged man with a white mustache sitting at the bar who vanishes out of sight. And in 1987, a guest said they saw a nurse pushing a gurney down the hallway in the middle of the night. But maybe most terrifying of all is room 202, where allegedly someone managed to photograph a ghost and prove its existence. Coming in at number 2, The Peel Mansion. Back in 1875, this mansion was built by a man named Samuel Peel. He was a US congressman and he lived in the home with his daughter Minnie. Both Peel and Minnie are said to haunt the house today, roaming the halls dressed in white, and often Minnie will play the piano if no one is in the room. But despite being the people the mansion is named after, they might not be the creepiest ghosts to haunt its halls. After the Peel family sold the mansion, a couple named Mr. and Mrs. English moved in with their family. One of their daughters, Marjorie, however, became very ill, and after discovering that she'd suffered from a burst appendix, a surgeon informed the family that she was not going to make it. After 10 days, Marjorie died and they covered her body in a sheet. But creepily, only a few hours after being pronounced dead, someone saw the sheep move. Marjorie was alive and went on to live for many more healthy years. But this troubled some of the staff on the farm who believed that her spirit hadn't gotten back into her body and was somehow trapped under that sheet that others had seen moving. Years went by and Marjorie went back to her childhood home only to find that the room where people thought she had died was closed off. When she asked why, she was told it was haunted by a little girl. But the question was, is it Minnie or somehow the lost spirit from Marjorie's almost death? And last up in our number one spot, Highway 365. The legend began back in 1973, when a man picked up a girl on a bridge in the night. She was covered in bruises and cuts and looked very scared. She told the man that she had been in a car accident and asked if he could drive her home. The man complied and when they got to the house she said was hers, she suddenly vanished from his car. Too stunned to realize what he'd just witnessed, the man went up to the door of the house anyway. The door was answered by the girl's father, who said that she had just died on that very bridge last month. But he wasn't the only one to see the girl in white as she became known. The next year, a different man picked up a young woman on a bridge and drove her home. When they arrived, she asked if he could knock on the door since the house was dark. But when the door opened, the girl was gone and the mother explained that her daughter had died one year earlier that same night. Finally, another year went by and another man picked up the same girl dressed in white near a bridge in the rain. He offered her his coat to keep her warm and when they got to her house, she vanished along with his coat. After talking with the dead girl's parent, who said she visits every year on the anniversary of her death, he went to visit the girl's headstone only to find his missing coat draped across it. Mm -hmm. 